Looks like we are rather stable now in uh, terms of participants. So I maybe formally open uh, uh, this uh, tutorial, which is also usually the opening uh, uh, of the ESF users meeting. So welcome everyone, despite I can't see you because you all kindly switched off your video, which is very nice. I'm happy to see at least so many names on my participant list. Um, um, that's the uh, 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 sixth time we are doing this volume image analysis uh, tutorial at the ESF user meeting, the second time uh, in this online format, which has this the big, big advantage that we are not limited by the size of the room. So we have much more participants than usually, that, where I'm quite happy that uh, also shows that we have a quite uh, interest in what we are doing here. Um, Everyone who joined is uh, uh, muted and, and, and switched off this video, so that's I told already several times, so thank you for that. Um, the program in the morning is uh, based on lectures, so uh, the idea is because volume image analysis is a wide field, uh, uh, basically to give people an idea what's existing. Uh, so we have to be very clear in a one day tutorial, uh, um, we will not make you from beginners to experts. The idea is to give an overview of what exists. Uh, to show sources of information, to bring you in touch with people who are working in the field, who are open to collaborate, and uh, by that making you an entry point uh, into, into the image analysis topic. Uh, um, that's basically, if, if, if you manage that by the end of the day, I'm very happy. Yeah? If you manage more, then I'm even more happy. Yeah? Okay, I talked enough. I think uh, um, I'm very happy the first presentation is uh, uh, by, by tradition always uh, one which is basically more dedicated to the basics of uh, or like an introduction lecture uh, um, um, done for, for the image analysis field i'm quite happy that francois perrin uh, um, agreed to take this opening slot francois perrin is uh, uh, one of the pioneers using synchrotron microtomography here at the esf for many years very successful on uh, the specific field of bone research uh, initially in the field of microtomography, uh, um, combined with a lot of image analysis. So basically the big success is here that uh, Francois managed not only to look at these pretty pictures, yeah, but really to be able to derive quantitative results of that. And that developed further. She's now heavily using the nano imaging stations, looking further at the ultra structure of bone and does many other things. So uh, if you're interested to, to see what can be done with tomography and the bone research, yeah, I just strongly recommend you to Google Francois's uh, uh, publication record. Yeah, you will probably find a lot of inspiration. So Francois, can you share your screen? Yeah. Um, yes, I'm going to share my screen. Is it uh, okay? I put it full screen. I see your presentation, not your, oh, yeah, now I see it. Mm -hmm. I would say perfect. You have, yeah, let, as we said, roughly 40 minutes. 40 uh, minutes. When I switch on my camera and my video again, then uh, maybe around 35 minutes. Uh, and otherwise, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for the introduction. So I'm very happy to begin this uh, session. And uh, I will mainly speak uh, uh, about what is going before uh, the real volume image analysis. I will speak about uh, the introduction to the topic and uh, the, the way you get uh, the image. So this is the 3D X-ray image reconstruction. So I am uh, affiliated to uh, University of Lyon and uh, to the ASRS. Um, so first, uh, we are going for, in the volume image analysis, we are going from images to parameters. So the very first step is data acquisition in uh, X-ray CT. So you don't directly have your 3D volume, but you have data, which actually are a projection of your image. And then you need to, to obtain the image through a reconstruction algorithm. And in this case, you will get a 3D volume and in the case of uh, synchrotron radiation CT, what you will get if you are using monochromatic CT is uh, a map of the 3D uh, X linear X-ray attenuation coefficient for the energy that you are using. And then you have got this nice image, but what you want is uh, finally to have some quantitative information about these uh, uh, objects that you are scanning. 
And that generally what you need to do is you need to segment, to binarize the, the feature, the structure of interest. For instance, here it's trabecular bone from a human. So you want to segment this trabecular structure, which in this case is not very difficult, but you may have different uh, contexts for different application. And from this 3D image, you want to get a number of parameters. So the, the network actually is quite complex because you see that here it's a <clears throat> complex topological object. So you can get morphometric parameters like the volume of bone, like uh, the trabecular thickness, the thickness of these uh, features or the trabecular spacing. But you can also get some morphometric parameters <clears throat> and you have a wide literature on how to extract these parameters. So, um, so you have the first step, which is image formation, and then you have the next step, which is image analysis. So in, in, in image forest construction, so you are typically going from the raw data that you acquire on the beam line to the 3D image. So I will uh, basically talk about this. So I will introduce what is the problem to go from the raw data to the 3D image and uh, mention different generation of reconstruction methods. And then I will just uh, make a very short introduction to image segmentation because it will be more detailed in the next talks. And I will just show that uh, uh, in a way, this step is related to what you have done in the reconstruction step. So you cannot uh, take them completely independently. Um, so what is image reconstruction? So first of all, I will start with the 2D X-ray CT, so which was the, the, the basis for CT, the first uh, computer tomographic uh, method were done in CT. And basically you will uh, use uh, X-ray source and take measurement on a section uh, to be imaged. So when we talk of 2D CT, of course the object is generally always 3D, but uh, we mean that we are uh, reconstructing only a 2D image, so a section to be image. So what you are uh, basically doing when you are doing computer tomography, you take an X-ray source and you have a thin pencil and you measure the attenuation of the X-ray source along different parallel uh, rays. So with doing that, what you get is a set of measurements in a detector and basically what you what we call this one projection so it's based on attenuation measurement and this line of measurement you put it, you can put it as a line of values in a new image that will be the sign of one so you do that for another angle and you will get another set of parallel lines on which you take measurements and you will get a new a projection, so you will get a second line of measurement. And actually, you do that for every angle uh, between zero and 180 degrees, and you get uh, what we call a sinogram. So this is a set of data uh, of projection on your 2D slice. Um, and then this is not your image, the slice you want to re reconstruct, but then thanks to the apparition of computers, you will be able to do a numerical processing by solving an inverse problem, and you will be able to reconstruct your slice. So this is the, the principle of the very first generation of system uh, that was proposed by Unsfield, and it's also called a 2D parallel geometry system because all the rays of uh, measurements are uh, parallel for uh, one projection angle. So through the, through the years, this system has really evolved and uh, been uh, more fast by using different generation of uh, geometry of the X-ray source. You have got a fan beam system with a lot to speed up the acquisition process and also uh, with the time, it has been possible to do not only 2D CT, but also uh, 3D CT. So uh, in uh, the, for synchrotron radiation tomography now, what we are doing is mainly 3D CT. So I will explain briefly the principle of 3D CT. 
So um, you generalize the previous uh, principle of acquisition. You still use uh, X resource, and but this time you can have measurement not a, on a single line, but on a 2D detector. And you will have your, as you see below, you, you have your source rotating. And when you rotate around the object, which is here composed of these five spheres, you can get many projection under your um, object. So now you have not a single sinogram, but you really have a set of 2D projection. And this is the principle of cone beam X-ray city. And for cone beam X-ray city, now you have a lot of commercialized micro city device that you can use uh, outside uh, synchrotron, let's say. And if you, uh, just take the limit case of this convium geometry when the X resource is going to, uh, is sent to infinity. infinity. You, you can get the limit case, which is a parallel beam geometry, which means that the, the source is very far away. So you can assume that the rays are parallel between them and you rotate your object or your source detector as here. And, um, and you will get also a set of 2D projection, but where the cone is very far away, you can assume that you have a parallel beam geometry. And this is, for instance, what was implemented uh, on uh, beamline ID19 at ESRF to do uh, synchrotronization tomography. So now uh, what we, we have a set of data and we need to reconstruct the image. So what is the inverse problem in computerized tomography? So the inverse problem, uh, to, to solve the inverse problem, you, we need to, to have a model of the direct problem, which means of the measures. And uh, everything is based on the Beer-Lambert law, uh, which said how the X-ray beam is attenuated when you go to the object. So we always assume that we have a monochromatic beam, even if in uh, medicine, uh, for instance, when you use a standard scanner, it's not really sure, but we make this assumption. And then we know that we, if we have a X resource emitting some intensity I, zero, I zero, sorry, what you are measuring on the detector will be the intensity I, and it's related by this exponential law, which is the Beer-Lambert law, and mu is the linear attenuation coefficient if we assume an homogeneous object, and d is the length of the path. So this is very specific if we have a um, um, constant object, a uh, monomaterial object, and uh, some thickness, but of course, when you, you are going through the human body or any object, it's not necessarily um, constant, of course. And then this term um, min minus mu d is replaced by uh, the integral of the attenuation of the object in 3D, which is now denoted f, f of x, y, z, over the straight line d. And the straight line d joins the x resource to the detector. So what you do, you take the log of i0 over i theta for the given theta, which is the rotation angle, um, uh, angle of the projection. And this is really what you call the projection. It is the integral of this attenuation over one straight line. And when you vary the position of the X resource and the position of the point on the detector, you get a lot of measurement. And it is, so the inverse problem now consists in finding this f of x, y, z from the set of x line projection over a, a very large number of line projection. So uh, this will basically be a linear problem if we assume that the beam is monochromatic. So this assumption is quite important. And if we are doing 2D CT, as I showed in the first slide, actually we can show that what we want to do is invest a 2D Radon transform, which measure integral on straight lines in the plane. And um, if we, 
if we um, so so this is if we are in 2D, the problem is basically to invert the 2D random transform. But if we are in 3D, it's not exactly the same because the 3D random transform uh, consider integral of planes. So in 3D, we don't have to solve the 3D random transform, but what is called the 3D X-ray transform, which measure integral on straight line. Um, okay, so uh, there have been a, a lot of uh, different generation of reconstruction methods, and uh, the, the first of them are based on analytical methods and uh, the, the, the they are the ones that are directly related on the 2D random transform. And then in the years, there have been also iterative reconstruction methods. And then there have been the apparition of compressing sensing methods. And now we have uh, the generation of deep learning reconstruction methods. So I will give uh, an introduction to, to these different types of um, reconstruction methods. So it's uh, something still evolving. So in 2D, so in 2D, the very, the analytical, the basic analytical reconstruction method is a well-known filter back projection algorithm. So the problem that we have is that we have uh, this sinogram, which is a set of measurements, which is also the radon transform of the image, and which is called RF, the radon transform of F for U and theta. So theta is the angle and U is the position on the, on the detector. And from this radon transform, you want to get the image. So we are lucky in this uh, config configuration because we have an analytical solution. We have a formula that directly express the image f of y x as the back projection. So this is this integral of a theta over the angle of the projection, but it's p tilde theta. It is a projection that has been filtered with some filter k. So that means that in order to get your image, you just need to first filter each, each 1D projection p theta and then make a back projection. So to explain, so you will sum this filter back projection. So this is an example on this small uh, toy image. So you will do for each angle this back projection, which is the, the dual of the projection operator. And finally, at the end, when you have summed all the projection of a pi, if you are well sampled and so on, you will get uh, an estimation of your image. Uh, so in this case, not, note that uh, if you have uh, not the full range of projection, uh, for instance, if I stop the reconstruction for an angle uh, before pi, uh, I will not get the ideal image because uh, uh, this is um, an integral formula, and for this population, it needs to be calculated over the whole range p. So that shows first limitation of this kind of method is that you need to have all your data that everything is well sampled. Um, so next, uh, what did I do? <laughs> next, so you need a complete data set and the TPL typically a full range of angle in 180 degrees for a parallel beam. And typically you need a good number of projections. That means uh, that uh, you need to have a sufficient number of rotation angle. And typically if n, p, n is, um, NP is the number of points of your detector, you need to have approximately pi over two dot n projection to avoid Otherwise, you have this kind of artifact, which are called a strict artifact. Um, you can also have noise, and in particular, uh, this um, you have a filtering process in the projection, and um, this filtering process are, are actually the, the filter. Yes, I didn't say it. The filter, what what was called K, is. Um, called the RAM-LAC filter, and it is the, this blue line in the uh, frequency domain, and it's also called the RAM filter. So here you have the frequency zero, and uh, this filter, as you can see, when the frequency 
increase, uh, the, fil the value of the filter increase. So this filter will increase the noise. If you have noise in your projection, this filter will increase the noise. The RAM filter will increase the noise. So for instance, for this phantom, which is the Chef and Logan phantom, uh, you can notice that here you have very small feature with little contrast. And if you have noisy position, we, you will lose uh, this feature. And uh, in order to avoid that, you can use modified version of this RAM filter to, to lower the FA effect of noise. But in this case, also you will lose some uh, spatial resolution. So why? Could you have noise? You could have noise when you are doing low dose imaging, for instance. Uh, now, this was for the 2D uh, reconstruction, the filter pack projection. But when we are doing 3D uh, CT acquisition with a parallel beam geometry, uh, it's very convenient because actually you will get a set of 2D image uh, corresponding to the different projection of your object. And if you just take a given slice at a level Z, if I just cut the, the set of data along this direction, what I will get is a sinogram for this slice. And then uh, it's possible to apply the filter by projection algorithm to reconstruct this slice. And then you can get your 3D image by using a set of uh, 2D filter back projection. So it's very fast and very convenient. So, for instance, as I showed before, uh, here is a human trabecular bone that was acquired on beamline ID19 with a voxel size of five micrometer. So, you know, from this set of data, you can just get your image by uh, doing uh, successively different uh, filter back projection algorithm. Um, so, but of course, we can have uh, some artifacts in the, when using this algorithm. So, as I said before, we need to have a sufficient number of projections. We also need, need to have a good projection sampling, and the projection sampling is related to the spatial resolution of the detector. We can have noise, which is related to the number of detected phot photons, and you can have all, all the type of artifact like. Uh, um, if your object is larger than the field of view of the detector, you have truncated projection and you are in the situation of local city, which can also and which also introduce artifact. If your object is moving, uh, of course you you can have motion artifact. Um, if the beam is polychromatic, you can have what is called beam hardening artifact. And for instance, you have also an artifact which is related to the geometry, uh, because when you want to extend this filter back projection algorithm, in the case of cone beam projection, you have no more an exact reconstruction and you can get cone beam artifact. So this method is very convenient because it's fast, but also you have to satisfy the number of conditions to be able to apply it. Uh, the next generation of method, which uh, is also, has been also known for a long time, is iterative methods. So in this case, you don't try to, you don't use a continuous formulation of the problem like with the radon transform, but you will use a discrete expression of the problem. So I, I explain it in 2D, but it, it can be generalized of course to 3D. So imagine you have your 2D image, your 2D image is expressed as, uh, is represented in a finite basis of function. And for instance, of hj by a number of coefficient fj for j uh, between one and n. So basically if uh, hj is the indicator of a pixel, it, you, you just get the values of the different pixel of your image and you express it as a big vector. So this is the image you want to reconstruct. It's a big vector F. And now if you want to express a projection that is a line integral of, for instance, this line, you will sum a number of these uh, FG coefficients multiplied by some um, uh, weight. So for instance, here you will sum this uh, pixel two, this pixel, this one, and so on. So 
you can express this value pi as a linear combination of some uh, pixel values of your image. So now if you stack all your pixel value in a big vector p, uh, and if you put all your unknowns f in a big vector f of size n dot one, p is m dot one, uh, and you put the weight on a big matrix R, which will be M by N. So your problem is just equivalent to solve uh, a linear system. So just to show you, this is uh, uh, the example of this matrix R, which is the operator of uh, the radon, a discrete radon operator, let's say, for a 16 by 16 image. So and the blue correspond to zero and the other values correspond to value. So you see that it's a big matrix already, and, uh, but it has a lot of zero, but it has not a real uh, exploitable structure. So the problem is that you have a very large matrix. So if you have a, a real size image that you want to reconstruct, for instance, 512 by 512 of 1000 by 1000, you will have a matrix with 10 to the power 10 elements at least. So it's a very, very big matrix. And of course you cannot invert it because maybe it's not uh, invertible. And this can be done in 2D or in 3D and you can model every kind of uh, acquisition whatever it is parallel or divergent. So you can have between zero and an infinity of solutions. So it's not, it's, moderately ill pose problem, but it can be an ill pose problem. So of course you cannot invert this matrix. So you will generally use an iterative metro method. So I will not go into the complex literature of iterative method, of course, but uh, many methods are based for, on the ART uh, technique, which is the algebraic reconstruction technique. And uh, just to tell, sell you the idea, ID, you start with an initialization and you will refine the solution by adding, uh, by making an additive correction, by uh, back projecting the difference between the measured value and the calculated value for your iteration F. So basically, if we had two equations, the idea of this method, it's a CAC smart method, the idea is to project on one equation or on the other, and you will finally uh, converge to the solution. So this is the basis of the, this kind of method, but uh, it has, uh, it converge generally fastly, but if you have a lot of noise, for instance, it can also be semi-convergent, that means it begins to converge and then it can diverge. So you have to stop the iteration uh, quite, uh, sufficiently early. Um, so uh, actually when you are doing this art method or, or the kind of uh, iterative algorithm of this kind, what you are doing is minimizing uh, least square solution. This is a criterion. This is a least square error between your data P and your um, uh, measurement. So you are minimizing pa p, sorry, minus rf, uh, norm two of this. So uh, we know that this solution is unstable in the presence of noise. So when you use such a minimization, you can have some problem if you, your problem is ill posed. So what has been done is to change the functional and not only consider the data fidelity term, which is this least square term, but to add a pre prior to the solution. So you, for instance, you know that um, you will not have an infinite value between one voxel and its neighbor. So you have some sm smoothness of the solution and you can impose a smoothness prior on your object and then you will minimize this uh, new functional and in this case, you will stabilize your problem. So doing so and uh, uh, using smoothness prior uh, belongs to the family of what we call Tikhonov regularization. 
So you will, um, you will improve your solution by constraining it in a way. And this iterative method also, they have been known for uh, more than 30, 40 years, let's say. Uh, they were not implemented in the clinical city, for instance, because it, of course it's iterative and it's much more longer than uh, the uh, previous filtered back projection algorithms. But now with the improve of the computer power, even if the clinical CT, you can have, you can use such iterative technique. So there are many variants, but the idea is very often to do some correction to improve the solution. Uh, so, for instance, when it, is it used? It's used, for instance, in the, in the when FBP filter back projection does not perform so well. So, for instance, when you in a clinical CT, when you have low dose, you see that you have a lot of noise. And if you use an iterative algorithm, you can improve uh, largely your solution. However, uh, if Tikhonov regularization has uh, uh, add something to the reconstruction because it's robust to noise. It reconstructs a smooth image. And uh, in about uh, 15 uh, years ago, uh, there was a big uh, improvement by using the theory of compressing sensing. So compressing sensing, the basic idea is to reconstruct a signal or an image from few samples by assuming that it is sparse in a given basic. That means that it can, if you select correctly uh, uh, the basis in which you represent your image, uh, you can have only uh, a small number of non-zero coefficients in your image. So in this case, it is up, uh, what we are doing generally is it's difficult to, to solve the sparse representation uh, inverse problem, but you approximate it with a norm one minimization. That means that the prior term uh, instead of being a second order uh, norm um, term, you use a norm one term. And in this case, you will be closer to this compressive eye sensing ID, and you will uh, avoid to have this problem of reconstructing a smooth image. So this theory has been very important in the field of signal processing. And um, it has led to many uh, reconstruction methods. And one very popular method is called the TV regularization. TV is for total variation regularization. And it involves considering the, 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 the norm depending of, on the derivative of the image. So TV regularization penalize the oscillatory solution and will preserve the edge of your image. So it will avoid your image to be smooth. So you can use, there are many reconstruction methods that use this TV regularization and it's very well adapted if you have an object which is constant by piecewise constant. And another way to do it is to use wavelet regularization. So the wavelet transform is used as a sparsifying transform. And for instance, here you have a 512 by 512 image and you have is four level wavelet decomposition. That means that the image is decomposed on approximation and details at different scales. And why it is, is it a specific transform? Because if you need only uh, a small level of coefficient in the wavelet transform with, for instance, here with 10% of the strongest coefficient, you can still reconstruct a very good approximation of your image. So instead of having a TV term in uh, the, as a prior, prior, you can also use uh, wavelet transform as a sparsifying transform. So the W stands for the wavelet transform. So this is just an example on which we worked uh, for application to CT. It was the reconstruction of um, uh, of uh, the earth. If, to reconstruct the earth, you have the problem that uh, uh, the earth is moving, and then uh, you cannot use 
uh, all the projection because they correspond to different uh, phase of the earth motion. So you have you are obliged to subsample your projection. So you have a very low number of projection. And if you reconstruct with uh, FBP, you get a lot of strict artifact. So I, I have little time, so just go fast. So we applied, so we developed such uh, a reconstruction method based on the wavelet transform of TV minimization. And we had, um, we had a phantom of the earth. So we have a moving earth, basically based on a modified shape and Logan phantom. And this is the result and simulation uh, on the ground truth, uh, with the small number of projections that we had, the FBP is not good because you have too many strict artifacts. And with the TV penalized or wavelet penalized reconstruction, you can get a much better uh, reconstruction. Uh, so we developed an algorithm for that, and this was also applied in. in in, uh, for the seconds of uh, different cardiac phase. So this is uh, another possibility to uh, reconstruct image, but it has the problem that it still needs some time because you iterate uh, a number of uh, iterations to get the image. So now <clears throat> everybody is aware of the deep learning method. <clears throat> so you can imagine to have um, a network that will go from a deep learning network that will go from the, your sinogram, your data, to the CT slides. So the advantage is that uh, deep learning method requires training data pairs. It will improve the reconstruction quality if the network is well trained. And once the network has been trained, this is considerably fast, uh, even faster than the filtered back projection algorithm. So what are the challenge? It's more difficult to solve an inverse problem with deep learning than, than doing classification or segmentation. Um, you, you, you need also a simulation of 3D images from fully sampled data. That means you need good quality image to train your network. And you need to scale or normalize your data set. And you have to avoid overfitting, which is a standard problem in uh, deep learning. So <clears throat> there are many ways to, <clears throat> to do this, to use deep learning in reconstruction. And uh, <clears throat> for instance, you can start from the FBP solution or standard iterative solution and then doing inversion followed by denoising by taking advantage of the, of the physics. <clears throat> so uh, these are the four uh, solutions that have been presented in this paper uh, to, to, uh, to propose deep learning solution. Either you go directly from the sinogram to the slice, either you, you improve your sinogram uh, by deep learning, and then you do an analytic reconstruction. Either you do an analytic reconstruction and you obtain a bad image with artifact, and with the network, you can improve it. And either you can have a hybrid domain learning by doing um, something like iterative reconstruction also. Alors, um, so this was one of the first work uh, about uh, deep learning for CT. It was based on uh, improving the FBP uh, solution. It was called FBP ConvNet, and it was based on UNET, which is a well-known uh, network architecture in deep learning. And it shows the feasibility of this technique for CT. And uh, later on, there have been many applications of deep learning. Currently, there are many algorithms that are proposed to uh, do deep learning uh, uh, for CT with various network, various uh, solution. And a very big application of deep learning is for low-dose CT. That means uh, in, med in uh, clinical CT, of course, you want to lower the dose to the patient, but it can be also interesting for your samples if they are, are dose-sensitive. And 
by using the standard algorithm, you have a lot of noise, and uh, by using deep learning reconstruction, you can, in a way, uh, in, um, improve this reconstruction. So it has a great potential, uh, and also uh, it is, it, uh, it, it's also very interesting because it's fast, but you have to have access to representative data to train your network. It has to be reproducible. You have to have a robust method and you have to be able to evaluate your result. Um, so this was the first step of, um, of uh, your volume analysis is getting your image. And I just want maybe to, to finish on the problem of segmentation, which is following uh, the generally following this reconstruction step when you want to do volume analysis. Uh, segmentation is that you, you need to, uh, to binarize your, the structure of interest in, if in your image. And the choice that you have done in acquisition reconstruction will have a strong impact on image segmentation in particular spatial resolution and also the noise. And as we have seen, uh, we, depending on the acquisition condition, we can have a lot of noise in our image. So you have a number of uh, challenge in segmentation to, to get the small contrast between, if you have small contrast between some structure, if you have very small feature compared to spatial resolution, and if you have noise or artifact. Uh, so one very well-known uh, basic uh, segmentation method is just thresholding, uh, relevant thresholding. And for instance, just to show you uh, the impact on the image quality. So here you have an ideal image. Here you have an image with some noise. And uh, here you have the histogram of the image. And you can see that when the noise increase, of course, this is the histogram of your image. And typically, if you have a very good, uh, no, enfin, very little noise, you will, it will be very easy to find the threshold. But when the noise increase, it will be much more difficult to find the threshold for your image. So um, you have an impact of uh, the, the, the quality of your image. About your spatial resolution of pixel size is the same. If you have uh, an image here at 20 micron, a voxel size of 20 micron, or 40 micron, 80 micron, it's the same. If you look at your histogram, it will be more and more difficult to find a good threshold. And of course, at 80 micrometer, compared to the size of trabeculae, which is about uh, 150 micrometer, you will have so, uh, structure that is not so well under. So just to tell you that, uh, of course, uh, the segmentation uh, will uh, the, the segmentation will depend on the acquisition and the reconstruction quality. So it may be important to have a good reconstruction quality to be able to to assess the feature of your image. So maybe just to finish, uh, uh, um, bone image where we were interested in the micro cracks and in the assessment of the small porosities, which are osteocyte lacunae, which are cells, which include cells. And here it was possible to segment everything, the, the big pores, which are the averse canals, the small pores, which are the osteocytes, and the micro cracks, which are in blue. And uh, for which, uh, for the small osteocytes, you can use uh, many methods. Uh, to uh, assess uh, volume, orientation, and uh, thickness, and everything uh, about your structure. So I think uh, I have not so more time, so I will just conclude now. Uh, so volume analysis depends on the complete acquisition scheme. It can be challenging due to acquisition condition. Segmentation has a strong impact on quantification. And denoising or image enhancement can be included in the chain. Uh, so there are various uh, approaches, um, and you have to design proper workflow for a given application. And you will see many solutions with uh, software that will be presented in this session. 
And there are still uh, some open problems like the processing of very large data sets, the automatization, which is also necessary on very large data sets, and the validation of the segmentation method, especially for micro CT or uh, nano CT images. So just some acknowledgement to, for the image and uh, for the people uh, I've been working on, on this topic at, uh, in my lab at Cratis or at ESR. Thank you for your attention. attention. Thanks, Francois, for the nice talks and <clears throat> nice introduction into all the things about tomography and then the perfect overlap uh, guidance into, into segmentation. Um, as I wrote uh, in the chat, I don't know if everyone saw it. I would prefer that if you have questions, you, you type them into the chat. Uh, we are more than 50 participants. Uh, I don't see all you on the screen, so I will not see your hand rising. So if you have a question, please put them in the chat. Um, we have a bit of time. When, with one thing I would, I would start, because Francois, you spoke so much about the different reconstruction algorithms and approaches. Uh, I lost a bit touch over the years. What what is about the need for computing power? Because I remember we of course use a lot filtered back projection because it's so fast and simple. Uh, um, especially when you when you involve more more sophisticated things like iterative and deep learning. Uh, um, what what more on computing power would you would you would you say you need, or is it exactly the same nowadays? Um, <clears throat> so you mean yes. So the iterative method of of course, um, and the deep learning method, of, of course, you need uh, more uh, computing resources. So in the case of deep learning method, the, the computing resources will be necessary mainly for the training. So of course, the training is a challenge and uh, the network has to be trained with uh, representative data. And uh, if you are doing things in 3D, uh, of course, you you may need a lot of uh, computing resources like clusters, uh, or, and it's the same for iterative methods, uh, because of course uh, you don't need training, of course, but uh, you will have to iterate. And um, I would say that what I didn't say about the iterative method, if the mode the more sophisticated method, use this prior. So this prior must be well adapted to your application, first of all. And second, what is sometimes not um, so easy is to find the regularization parameters. So when you change your object, and depending on the algorithm, you have to set this uh, regularization parameters, which was the lambda in the functional, and uh, it's why it takes a long time because you have to make different trials to find the good regularization parameters. So, I mean, of course, uh, you need more computing power uh, to, to use this iterative method or uh, the um, deep learning method. And uh, the problematic maybe for a synchrotron is that you will have to scan a large variety of samples and uh, so you have to be sure that uh, uh, maybe the university, universality of the method is more difficult than if you use just the filter back projection because we know it works whatever is the object. For the iterative method or for the deep learning, it has to be more uh, fitted maybe to the kind of object that you have to scan. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, have, we have real questions now from the chat. Mm -hmm. I, I, I read you one, yeah. It's from Claire Walsh. She asked, uh, could you comment on the ideas of validation and ground truth? Mm -hmm. How do you approach getting a ground truth segmentation against which to validate? Okay, so uh, yes, for the segmentation, what is generally done, uh, the basic way to have uh, the ground truth is to do manual segmentation. But if I know that the, the ideas that are given in the question are, are the good one, yes. Uh, you can use manual segmentation. This is typically what is done in medicine, um, where the, the expert, the radiologist, which is supposed to be the expert, is contouring, for instance, the earth or anything. 
and you use different experts and you compare your algorithm to this manual segmentation. Uh, but this can be very difficult. I have no time to show, but uh, uh, maybe I can go back on some slide. Uh, well, in this case, uh, what you want to get is this very small uh, structure uh, connecting the different cells. And in this case, you can do manual segmentation, but only on very limited region of interest because it's very complex. And manual segmentation is also very challenging. So yes, uh, I think that another option is to have simulated dat data, to simulate that data with noise and so on, and to validate your algorithm on representative simulation. So yes, I think that this is the other option when it's not just segmenting a contour of the heart of the kidneys or like they, they are doing typically in medicine, but for this kind of structure, um, I think that synthetic data is a good option, but your simulation, of course, has to be as realistic as possible. So we are running a bit short in time, mm -hmm. but I have still one question. Maybe you can make a short answer. Yes. So Gang Li uh, just questions or ask, uh, could you comment on the compressive sensing method? Yes, so the compressive sensing method has been a real uh, step further in the reconstruction method. And uh, I must say that, for instance, the TV method I briefly uh, presented. And I may say that now when uh, people present a deep learning solution, generally they are compared to what you can get with the TV regularization reconstruction method. So it has become some basics and uh, it's still uh, used as comparison to show that you can do better than TV because TV is very good, but it has also some drawback because it favors the piecewise constant object. So if you have a, an object with large phase, let's say, it's well adapted, but if you have this kind of small structure, it will may not be uh, so adapted. Okay, then at this point, uh, uh, I thank Francoise again for her nice presentation. Every thank year you. something new, I'm very happy. I hope next year we see that again. Um, thank you very much, Alexander. <laughs> I will maybe mute you already. So I, yes, sure. I if you stop maybe sharing the screen. So we switch now uh, uh, to the next speakers. Sorry. Uh, uh, so it's uh, Vedrana Andersen Dahl and under, uh, um, I, I forgot two of you will start first. Vedrana. We'll start, but we will yeah, use yeah. my sound such that we don't need to switch. Uh, we sit okay. just next to each other here at, uh, at DTU. Okay. Um, just let me say I'm very happy that you joined again because I find this idea of the quantitative image analysis center very appealing. Uh, I, I will not speak so much. I guess you introduce your center yourself. Just I'm very happy you come and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I will be uh, speak, showing it from one computer and speaking through <laughs> another. So hopefully, hopefully it, it, it works out fine. So, so um, I will, uh, I'll just make a short introduction to uh, our uh, activity around the, the, the 3D Imaging Center and, and the image analysis activities around KIM. So my name is Anas Dahl and I'm a professor in 3D Image Analysis from DTU uh, and I'm, uh, I'm also heading this uh, activity around 3D Image Analysis uh, through the center that we call KIM and that's short for Quantitative Image Analysis uh, for 3D imaging data. Um, so the, the background of this is that that we have um, uh, we've got a large scale facility uh, being built in uh, or a few large scale facilities being built in Lund in Sweden, just uh, next to Copenhagen. And uh, another part of that is that we've established a 3D imaging center uh, with the lab equipment here at uh, the Technical University of Denmark. So it's the 3D imaging center. And uh, we also collaborate with researchers in Lund uh, at uh, Lund University, where they also have some, some, some lab equipment together with, with the, the MAX4 synchrotron. And uh, specifically for imaging, we are, we are part of uh, building the Denmark beamline, and we, will, we also have some, some, uh, some 
research affiliation with with the formax through our uh, our uh, colleague at lund university manuel larsen who's part-time at the formax beam line uh, when uh, analyzing 3d images the the, the most time-consuming part is uh, structural quantification and uh, it is uh, Typically also uh, people or scientists who has an interest in, in using 3D imaging might not come with a background in image analysis. And to, to uh, handle this, we've uh, decided to establish this uh, Kim Center, uh, which is focused on uh, collaborating with uh, users of 3D imaging or scientists in 3D imaging on, uh, on analyzing uh, the data. Uh, it's uh, also on competence development through workshops and summer schools and so on. And then we uh, develop some tools and some of these tools Vetana will, will introduce uh, after this, this fly-in. Um, and it's based on this, this collaboration between Lund University, Copenhagen University and Max4 together with, uh, with uh, DTU. And it's, it's been in the first part of the of the project it's been supported by the capital region of, of Denmark which is uh, hospital research uh, so therefore there's quite a number of, of examples that is uh, that is from uh, preclinical studies and we are also uh, uh, building a, uh, a platform for data analysis and and uh, the tools that we will be mentioning will be available on our web page which is, which is is also shown here so if we look at the, the analysis pipeline, it's, uh, it's, it was uh, also uh, shown by Francois just before. So it has to do with a sample that is then uh, created. Uh, of, we get some projection data uh, from the imaging process, and then there's a reconstruction. So we obtain an image. And that after we have the image, it's typically where uh, the, we will be uh, working. So it's especially uh, focused on segmentation or other feature quantification techniques, and then quantifying the structures that, that we get out of the, of the segmentation. That's, that's where we have our focus. And this is illustrated here with, uh, with an example of a, of a, a scan of um, some peripheral nerves where we, we segment out individual axons and get a distribution of, for example, nerve diameter. And, and the bottom row shows uh, the same process for, for another type of nerves, uh, which is, is brain tissue, where we also have, in, have done some research in investigating uh, morpho morphology of, of the, the axons in the, in the brain. Um, so I just put in this slide to, to, to remind everybody that when we, when we talk about segmentation, it's not, it's not just uh, one uh, thing that we do, but it, it's very much dependent on the problem at hand. So uh, I've illustrated it here with, uh, with a, a CT scan or a slice through a CT scan of uh, a bone. So this is a, a tibia of a mouse. Um, and if we are interested in, in looking at the bone structure, the segmentation is relatively trivial. We can just do a threshold and get out uh, more or less a, a very accurate segmentation of the bone. But if we are interested in also the cartilage structure, which is the second, it's a little bit more difficult. The, 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 the contrast for the cartilage is, is a little bit lower and doing a threshold there, we will also get most of it, but it's still, still quite okay. If we are, however, want to, to segment out the different regions, uh, we would need another approach. And this one uh, here, I've illustrated it with, with the different colors for different regions. And I actually just manually delineated this for the illustration. And, and uh, the last one is, is um, if we want to look at uh, different textures. And here I've used a, a, a texture-based uh, analysis technique for automating uh, the, the segmentation of, of the structures depending on, on how fine uh, the structures are in the bone. But, but, but this will all depend on uh, what, what type of structures we're interested in. So that's very important to remember. That's also part of, of the, the analysis that is making these, uh, these decisions. Uh, and these are, are subjective decisions that depends on the problem that we want to solve. Um, 
just uh, to return to the the, the center, we we've, we've uh, recently uh, uh, gotten some some um, extra funding for a, a new uh, project to continue our work, and that is uh, that is focused on uh, coupling uh, the 3D image analysis uh, to AI research. So um, so we will um, uh, build a platform for, for, for image analysis, which we've already started in the KIM project, but we will also uh, start preparing some, some data sets for, for deep learning. And this is, this is a five years project that we hope that we will get some input from the, from the community. And that might be, be all of you uh, for, for good ideas on, uh, on cases and on how we can, we can make this such that we both develop tools that can be useful for uh, scientific studies of, of various samples, and also generate some data that can be interesting uh, when you want to develop uh, the next generation of uh, deep learning or, or machine learning based algorithms. And this is, this is also going to be a, a part of the, the Kim Center. So, um, so to do this, we will, we will build a platform for image analysis, and that's also part of the, the options for collaborating with us. Um, that is that, uh, that we will, uh, besides just providing the methods, also have a place where you can, you can store your data and, and uh, use the methods to avoiding the hassle of installing uh, some of the software on your own computer. So that's some of the ideas that, that we will um, continue working with in the Kim project. Um, I've just uh, to acknowledge some of the, my colleagues that contribute to this. So this is, this is people involved in the, in the Kim project. And then uh, I also have a, a picture of the, the research group that I come from, which is uh, visual computing at DTU Compute, where we do uh, more than just 3D image analysis, uh, as you can see on this slide. Uh, uh, and there's a, there's a group of, of approximately 45 uh, people uh, working with, with all aspects of, of image analysis, computer graphics, and computer vision. So this was the fly-in, and now I will stop sharing for Vetona to take over. Yes, thank you. So I'll share my desktop, and then I'll go here. Does that show good? Yes. Yes. Excellent. So... Um, Yes, uh, uh, so my name is Vedrana Dale and I'm also here at DTU Compute and also working within Kim and uh, Anna's presented so nicely uh, what we do. So I'll go through some of my first slides a little bit, um, a little bit fast. Um, but uh, as already mentioned, we do quite a lot of quantitative image analysis in mostly preclinical science, uh, preclinical uh, medical science, uh, material science with the data from uh, either labert labert lab laboratory or uh, large scale um, X ray CTs. Um, and uh, Anna's already mentioned uh, how uh, some of these uh, problems can be quite challenging because we often uh, need to or want to quantify some global or we want to link some global property of material with its microstructure, how it looks like. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, can be quite challenging. So to show you one example, uh, I have uh, an, uh, a schematical uh, drawing of, uh, of uh, liver here. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll in a while show you how liver looks in uh, CT scans, uh, which we have obtained, or rather to say some of our collaborators obtained uh, with the aim of quantifying the size and the shape of these small capillaries here called sinusoids. Can you see my mouse moving? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Um, so uh, the hypothesis is that the disease, liver disease, fibrosis will affect uh, the size and the shape of these, uh, these cavities. Uh, so by, if we look at the data, it looks like this. Uh, on the top part of the screen, we have diseased liver and on the bottom side, we have healthy liver. So um, I guess that by looking at these images, uh, 
uh, you, um, how to say, can uh, appreciate the, the, the difficulty of this quantification problem because obviously I cannot just measure, let's say, size of one cavity in the top image or, or, or few cavities in top image and few cavities in the bottom image because by choosing uh, places where I measure the sizes, I would, uh, I would bias my, uh, my, uh, my result. Uh, so uh, if we want to get any result with, with good statistical significance, we need to do the automated analysis on, on large, large images, on whole of the image um, in, in somehow um, a consistent way. And, um, and, and this, kind of, this kind of analysis can be difficult and often we, we work with this kind of problems, which sometimes develop, sometimes with the need of developing uh, almost custom-made analysis methods for each data set we work with. Um, Anna's also mentioned uh, uh, Kim tools, and uh, I will present two of those today. And if you, uh, this will be just a little bit of a little teaser. And if uh, those tools sound interesting to you, uh, then join us in our hands-on session uh, today in the afternoon. Um, so, uh, but but before we go, I get to those two tools. Um, I will just like to point out one thing, and this is a state of the art in in segmentation. Uh, how to say maybe my take on that. Uh, so um, uh, to uh, illustrate my point, I have uh, I have taken a little bit of uh, information. I have stolen something from from three uh, research papers surveys. Uh, so the first, sorry, the first one is a uh, survey on image segmentation using deep learning, uh, which um, uh, the second one is in on med medical imaging, and the third one is for uh, visual computing in material science. So uh, just briefly. Um, if reading the first paper, one would uh, one would easily conclude that segmentation is a solved problem uh, because there are large data sets um, of uh, uh, of photographs that have been segmented, and with the deep learning, um, whatever we need to segment, we just need to feed feed our favorite network with enough data, and we will get uh, almost perfect results. Um, reading a little bit uh, towards the end of this paper, uh, one can uh, find passages uh, saying that, uh, well, um, with rising popularity of 3D image segmentation, there is a strong need for large scale annotated 3D image data sets, which are more difficult to create than uh, two dimensional counterparts. And then also uh, challenges in how deep learning can be combined with earlier segmentation models. So. Uh, it's it's kind of it 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 feels that in the field of research that let's say I work with, uh, maybe not everything is as solved as one would uh, one would believe. Um, then going into medical imaging, which is a little bit closer to uh, to uh, analyzing data from large scale facilities, let's say, there is uh, much more much more more challenges. Uh, traits of in, uh, medical imaging have been. Uh, uh, mentioned where uh, all those traits uh, uh, are valid uh, even more acutely uh, for, for uh, images which are large in scale. And then also, uh, how to say, acknowledgement that there are segmentation tasks like segmentation of the vasculature, and let me just read the last part of the sentence, is still an open problem. So uh, again, maybe not everything is sold using deep learning yet. Um, and then the funny thing is, if looking at the paper on material science, um, there is, um, because which describes what is used uh, in practice uh, when doing visual computing on samples in material science, uh, there is absolute absence of deep learning. Uh, it has almost not been mentioned. Just in the end of the paper, there is a small note that, oh, well, this deep learning is coming. Maybe it will solve some of our problems. So I, I feel that the situation is such that we have, in, in at least in some part of image analysis, we have not yet, um, we are not yet there where we can, um, where we can harvest 
uh, the result from this in, in enormous uh, development which deep learning has had in analyzing photographs and and also up to certain degree some medical data sets. So with that said, um, let me introduce you to two tools uh, that we have uh, developed in Kim and which uh, have nothing to do with deep learning. It's a very classical image analysis. Um, and the first one is on surface uh, segmentation. So um, the motivation for this is that um, that many uh, tissues um, and uh, many man-made objects uh, have a structure uh, where there are uh, things, materials coming in layers. Um, and uh, to show uh, this, uh, I have on the left actually exactly the same data set just shown from a different uh, slicing uh, that Anas was showing the, the bone. So this is the uh, mice tibia uh, cut in such a way that we can see this growth plate, which is where the bone is growing. And, um, and this has a layered structure in 3D. Um, the second example here is a man-made material. It is a, a CT scan of, uh, of packaging. We had a collaboration with Tetra Pak where we scanned some of their packaging. And this is a thin layer of aluminum uh, with two layers of polymer uh, on top and the bottom. It is the part of the packaging where you put the drinking straw uh, through. Uh, so um, in, in those two cases, we wanted to have exact geometry of this layer. And this surface segmentation that I'm going to show you uh, is what we have uh, been using to, to find the, the result. Another motivational slide here is, uh, is a list of papers uh, which, uh, well, they are not on the, on, the, on, the, on the layer segment or surface segmentation, but where we have used this method in, in larger or lesser degree. And maybe I can just point out that that there are synchrotron uh, X-ray computed tomography. Uh, here we have um, uh, data uh, obtained at synchrotron, and I'm pretty sure that if I looked more into uh, into this, uh, there is here uh, data uh, collected at synchrotron. So, so um, uh, how to say a method which in practice has turned out to be useful for analyzing also large data uh, which we collected. So um, just to uh, briefly introduce you to the basics of the method, I, I will switch to 2D, which is easier both to visualize and explain. So uh, surface segmentation deals with uh, imaged, uh, well, well, images where there is something coming in layers and, um, um, and, and this method requires me to define something called a cost function. Um, basically, I need to do the filtering of my, of my, of my uh, raw image or of my uh, volume, such that the pl places where surface is to be found appear dark. Um, this is because this is an optimization method uh, in, in the last end, it is sold using a graph cut um, algorithm who, and that algorithm is going to find connection from, now I'll show you here in 2D, a surface would be just a line. So connection from left to right, which visits only dark pixels. Now, um, if I uh, looked for this uh, connection from left to right, which visits only dark pixels, and I have not constrained this curve to be smooth, then maybe let's say that here I had some parts which are very dark, maybe this curve would jump very much up and down because going from left to right, it would in every column of this image, it would find the darkest pixel and in that way it could jump from left to right. But in this, using this method, we can constrain the smoothness of these uh, objects of the surfaces uh, in 3D and, and lines in 2D by saying that the neighboring columns, uh, that the surface between the neighboring columns shouldn't move less or shouldn't move more than some, um, well, use user, uh, user chosen uh, parameter delta here. And, and this allows us to find smooth surfaces in both 2D and 3D. Even uh, more useful is the fact that we can 
define uh, or we can we can ask this method to give us multiple surfaces like here i say that i want to have four surfaces going from left to right uh, which all should be uh, how to say going on the darkest pixels well uh, if I did not put additional constraint, um, which I will explain just in a little while, well, all of those four surfaces would be exactly the same because uh, they would all agree which is the which is the like cheapest way from left to right. But I can put additional constraint to this, asking that um, asking that uh, there is a certain distance between my surfaces, so I can constrain how close they can get to each other and i can also constrain how far they can get from each other and all these possibilities of putting these geometrical constraints allow us to uh, how to say set up segmentation which exactly gives us the solution or hopefully gives us the solution that um, that uh, we want that, that that is useful for us. I will also in a while show you how this can be used for uh, for uh, segmenting tubular and round surfaces. But first, let me show you how um, what what this method actually gives me. So um, this this is um, this is a CG images um, of uh, of uh, uh, a wind turbine blade. Uh, you can see the composite material here, which is not of interest right here, because here what we wanted to quantify is the thickness of two layers of paint. So there has been two layers of paint applied at this uh, at this uh, 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 wing, and um, and uh, and there is a tiny darkish line uh, separating the two layers. Now, if I was to uh, try to let's say segment dark things in order to get this darkish line out i would be i would have a hard time but um i could uh, put up segmentation method uh, where i wanted to find three surfaces um the one one is the one uh, uh, here on the top of this material the second is the surface where uh, composite material and the paint meet so i could using some um, filtering create cost volumes for those two surfaces and then for the third surface i've used very strong constraints saying it needs to be approximately between those two and with certain distances from the one and the other which i have estimated by looking at the data and we managed to find those three surfaces to quantify thickness of this paint layer um, so this would not be possible if my geometrical constraints have not been so so uh, so so how to say rigidly set. I'll quickly now go through some examples, and then uh, if you uh, feel like it, to join us uh, for the hands-on, and we can uh, we, I can I will introduce you to how this method is uh, is working. So in uh, in again my Sibia. Um, some the the growth layers which are very difficult to segment using layered surfaces here uh, we have segmented uh, this layer into the part where there is more slim bone part where there is just uh, um, uh, cartilage parts where we have fine trabecular structure and parts where we have uh, uh, rough trabecular structure and as cost images for this segmentation we have used actually outcome of the texture uh, analysis um, and that allowed us to quantify the fine and uh, and rough trabecular structure in this mouse bone. Um, I al already said that by folding out the geometry of my images, I can uh, use similar approach for uh, for tubular or round surfaces. And uh, one project we worked quite a lot on is a segmentation of nerves in 3D data. So uh, here we wanted to quantify um, well, uh, uh, we wanted to quantify a trajectory and organization of uh, myelinated axons uh, in human peripheral nerves because we had samples from both diabetic people and, uh, and, and healthy controls, and we wanted to see whether there is difference between the two, and for that we have uh, used uh, layered segmentation where we have folded out, and this is actually exactly what we are going to do in the hands-on, where we have folded out the volume around every axon and we have used the surface segmentation in order to get the surfaces of individual axons. And um, 
in that way, how to stop obtaining results, which uh, our collaborators, medical doctors were very thrilled because uh, we could see that the, that the nerves are, or, uh, are, uh, are twisting around each other. And that is something which you cannot, um, cannot see if you just uh, look at 2D images of, uh, of nerves. Um, in our group, we have worked extensively with making these methods um, faster and uh, uh, applicable also on large volumes. So we are able to uh, segment uh, a, a large uh, CT volume of 2000 cubed uh, voxels. Um, th that is, th and yes, and, 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 and many of those volumes. I, I, I will just also say that similar thing can also be used for, for round surfaces, but, but there, there we need a little bit more, so maybe I should, uh, I should not go into details about how that is, uh, that is done. But here you can see an example of segmenting a brain in the, um, in the, in the skull of a bird, or even segmenting um, uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, um, of uh, bubbles uh, in, uh, in images of liquid, uh, liquid foam. I think it is aluminum foam. I'm actually not quite sure what kind of foam this is. Okay, so so this was this is my part on the surface segmentation, and uh, and and take home message here is that if you can uh, uh, <coughs> if you can formulate your segmentation problem in such a way that you find surfaces in the volumes, maybe uh, your segmentation will be easier than if you just tried pixel wise uh, approach. The next thing that I want to uh, introduce is uh, uh, analysis of the orientations. Uh, and that is also something that we have prepared a little bit less than surfaces, but also we have a notebook uh, for the hands-on uh, part in the afternoon. So um, we have often um, in situation, we are often in a situation where we uh, are analyzing some kind of fibrous material. Here we have a composite material with glass fibers. Uh, here we have, uh, the next image is an image of stone wool uh, used in uh, building industry. The third is an um, zoom or a part of the of the monkey brain, so axons in monkey brain. Then we have cardboard fibers, and the last one is the cotton, so uh, a textile, uh, so cotton fibers in textile. And um, for this, uh, we have often used structure tensors, which is an approach of uh, uh, of getting an, an uh, orientation in three D. And here is again. Um, a little bit of some of the publications that we have uh, where we have used structure tensor uh, segmentation. And again, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that there are, um, that there are, well, actually not here. There is not so much from, C from, from synchrotron data. That's because we are still in process of having that published. But, but we find also this method very, very useful. So let me just briefly, uh, uh, for those that, 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 that don't know it, uh, let me just uh, briefly explain in 2D what this method gives me. So um, here on the left, I have, uh, in just in 2D again, because it's easier, I have, uh, I have shown in orange uh, two uh, like windows, in this case round, but it can be squared, it does not matter, two windows which are displaced slightly along the direction of some imaged fiber. And in, in green, two windows that are displaced in, well, not along the direction, but even I would say orthogonal to the direction of some kind of fiber that is here. And if you now imagine me comparing the intensities uh, of, the, of the two orange windows, they would be very similar because the structure did not change much when I've displaced the window. While here, the structure has changed more when I displace the window orthogonal to the direction of the fibers. So this change in a window in, or pixel intensities in some windows, um, can be, I, can, I can write it out and I can uh, approximate this change using a, a Taylor, uh, um, um, uh, uh, sequence of and 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 it 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 turns out that this um, uh, how to say uh, uh, a change in intensities or the sum of sense squared uh, in change in intensities can be expressed um, using a uh, two times two or let's say 
uh, displacement vector times matrix times the same displacement vector. That will give me uh, the sum of square change of intensities where this S is a two times two in case of 2D uh, symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. In case of 3D, it will be three times three matrix. So we have this matrix, which um, how to say encodes uh, orientation in, in 2D or 3D and finding the dominant orientation amounts to finding the direction u which minimizes this change of intensities and that is basically a, a eigen decomposition of this uh, of this matrix so sorry i just moved the slide a little bit too fast so basically i can in every pixel of my image compute this matrix do the eigen decomposition of it and by doing that i will find the <coughs> dominant dominant orientation in my data uh, a little bit of more of how this works uh, if you are wondering why should that work i have here a patch um, because this is this is the expression for this two two times two matrix how it should be computed so we should have an image uh, in derivatives in x direction in y direction when it's 2d um, and then we should construct this matrix such that that the squared uh, patches are here in the diagonal, uh, while on the on the on the other two elements, I have a uh, derivative in x direction multiplied with v, y direction, and then summed over all of this window. And if I have horizontal uh, horizontal um, uh, uh, um, let's say a fiber in my image. Then derivative in x direction will be uh, will have will have a strong response in y not so much, and by doing constructing the matrix according to this recipe, I would get something which has a strong response here. An eigen decomposition of this would return uh, uh, one predominant one predominant uh, eigen vector. Now, if I had uh, a diagonal structure, it's things would look differently and uh, and my matrix would uh, and 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 because both x and y derivative look similar all four elements would be similar and again i would have another response for my eigen decomposition here i have uh, drawn a, a few more examples where you can see that um, okay maybe i should actually explain so what is drawn here is the is the largest eigenvector and we are looking for the smallest because we are looking for the direction where the change of the intensity is smallest. Never mind, we will do a little bit of that in the afternoon. Maybe it's more important to tell you about our Kim tool and what we have been using it for. So um, in, in, in Kim, we have developed an implementation of structure tensor where we advocate use of Gaussian kernels uh, for the two important steps in computation of structure tensor. The first step is computing gradients in the image. And the second step is in averaging this information in some windows. So this, these are some implementational choices and different implementations uh, can be found. But we have found uh, this fact, this use of Gaussian kernels very, uh, very nice. Um, and uh, this means that our structure tensor implementation has two parameters. One is a noise scale, uh, which is a standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel, which we use for computing derivatives. And second is integration scale, which is a Gaussian um, or standard deviation of Gaussian kernel, which we use for uh, integrating this information over the window. Well, the first one noise scale has to do with noise in the image. So you need to uh, maybe manually tune it while the second one has to do with the sizes of the structures that you are analyzing. So this implementation that we have makes it very easy to, how to say, to change these parameters and by doing that, uh, analyze uh, um, uh, structures of different size. So um, what is nice about structure tensor, I will now show you one experiment in 2D uh, with some, um, with some, um, uh, uh, very, very, um, how to say, strongly degraded image quality. Um, what is nice is that on the left, uh, I am analyzing high resolution image 
and um, and changing the integration scale. So when I have a small integration scale, my response is very local. But when I have a large integration scale, my response is smoothed out on this image. And on the right side of my image of my uh, of my screen, I have a very degraded image where individual fiber can uh, not be segmented. And um, if you uh, you can you can probably notice that well orientation information from structure tensor is pretty similar in a very in, in in high resolution image and low resolution image. So conclusion is that here the most important orientation information is very robust to change to changing overall scale. It means that we can image our structures, our, fi our fiber fibrous material. Uh, with uh, uh, less smaller, uh, sorry, with bigger uh, voxel size uh, and capturing uh, uh, larger samples. And, and by doing that, we can, um, how to say, get information about uh, 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 more regional uh, information about the material properties and not, not only local information. So um, uh, I will just show you a few examples. This is a, a little test cube that we will also uh, do analysis of in the in the afternoon. Um, actually, point of this um, this slide is that when working with orientations in three D, one has to be careful about how to visualize it. So here I visualize orientation information using color, uh, using this uh, color sphere, such that. Uh, um, um, and the, the problem here is that in this 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 cube, I have uh, some fibers going diagonally uh, this way. You can see my mouse still, and some others going diagonally the other way. So, but but so it's those two layers. Um, but because of my color scheme, um, both those two layers uh, have been encoded using same color because the color on this sphere here and the color on the opposite side is the same. So by using more appropriate color scheme, uh, you can you can how to say get the true information about the distribution of the orientations. But this choice needs to be made made based on the material you have at hand. There is no uh, universally uh, perfect uh, way of coloring orientation. Um, we have analyzed quite a lot of composite materials using this method. So here you can see. Um, layers of composites uh, with fibers coming in different directions and we were able uh, to detect even a very uh, subtle changes in orientations so here uh, those bundles are, are, are wiggling a little bit because of stitching and we have been we, we have I, I believe for the first time we managed to quantify the effect of this stitching in in full 3d um, here are some examples where I analyze um, 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 uh, fiber reinforced polymers that has been uh, injected in this test sample from two inlets, such that the flows of the fibers met in the middle. And on the top is the result of the analysis of the sample. And on the bottom is the outcome of simulation, uh, uh, finite element modeling uh, uh, simulation of the flow showing that that our, uh, our our measurements are very close to simulated results. Uh, we have used a similar method for analyzing the accents uh, orientation of accents in mouse brain. And I think maybe I have another, the last slide I have uh, has to do with the fact that a structure tensor is not only giving me the dominant orientation, but it also gives me a measure, a degree of, uh, of, of, of how to say, how much fiberness there is in the sample. Um, there are three eigenvectors, uh, in, sorry, eigenvalues in 3D, and the ratio between the three, uh, can, we can use it to determine whether the window, analyzed window, whether it contains mostly uh, uh, linear things or mostly spherical things or mostly planar things, but I don't have an example of that. And, um, and, um, and, and so, so we can also quantify how much linearity there is in material. And for example, here we have analyzed fiber reinforced uh, polymer that has been recycled 
So it has been regrinded, and in this process, uh, some fibers or quite a lot of fibers broke, and we could quantify the mat material properties from, from these samples using, again, structured tensors. So um, just to conclude, if you can formulate your problem as surface detection, try to do that. If you have fibrous material, maybe you don't need to segment fibers uh, in order to get quantification, quantitative information about, uh, about the orientation and, and the stability of your approach might be improved by using, um, how to say, a good implementation of structure tensors. So that was uh, my uh, teaser for, for the afternoon session where I hope to see uh, some of you. There was a question in the chat. Was yeah, there a question? Ah, uh, yeah, you, if you want, you can read them yourselves. But yes. first, thanks for the nice presentation, both of you. And thanks for Thank reminding you. that we have this afternoon session with the hands out. Great, yes. uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. So there was a question, do you consider using sterology in combination with 3D imaging relevant to give a representative unbiased results on a subset, for example, of the liver sphenocytes you show? Yes, uh, I guess we would. Um, um, I, I, but but I, I would say the, the answer is yes, we have how we are aware uh, aware of uh, of the approach, but uh, I don't think we have used any of the no. principle of sterology in uh, in um, in our work. Maybe we are a little bit biased uh, by the wish of having a segmentation, right? Very often, even though we want, I mean, quantifying is, is like uh, one motivation for the work we do. We still often also want to have some visualization and, and, and uh, to, to, to also qualitatively look at the structures we have, which I guess uh, sterology would, uh, would, mm -hmm. uh, would maybe lack. I, I can just comment on the, on the liver sinusoids and that analysis. We, 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 we did different types of segmentations uh, and that was all done with the unit deep learning. Uh, yeah. so, so, um, so segmenting out the structures and measuring, quantifying the structures as a whole. And that's, that's soon to be finished work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we switch then to the third presentation in this morning session by Joseph Baptista. Joseph Baptista is also one of the uh, uh, speakers who now regularly joins our uh, uh, tutorial, which I'm very happy, presents a uh, image analysis software, which I'm sure he will introduce us uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes. And similar like to the previous speaker, also there will be a hands out uh, breakout session in the afternoon where people can then directly interfere with him. So I will not talk too much. I'm very happy that you agreed to give a presentation here and the floor is yours. Yeah, okay, so, thank you. Um... So, um, well, my presentation today will be um, kind of a complement and complementary with um, with the one that I had last year. So um, it will be so continuing with explaining you how to use image processing. So it will be a little less theoretical, uh, a little more practical. So I will mainly work on the, directly on the um, on the software. Um, but well, before doing that. Um, maybe some of you didn't attend last year, so I will just explain briefly who we are. So we are a company, um, commercial company that is dedicated to scientific image processing. And we develop one single product that can be proposed as two different, uh, different, two different usages as a pure library. So without any graphical user interface, which is IPSDK, uh, IPSDK meaning Image Processing Software Development Kit or um, using a graphical user interface, so that uh, I will show you today, uh, which is IPSDK Explorer. And of course, we will uh, support all our community or our users um, based on trainings that can be uh, generic training, customized training, very specific or with very precise topics like, I don't know, coding or whatever. Um, and also about um, developing, uh, tuning, customizing uh, IPSDK. So it can be because while well, you already have a, your own um, your own algorithm, your own tools that you like to optimize and would like to integrate in IPSDK. So that's the kind of thing that we can do to enhance um, the core library. 
or we can completely based on your own workflow, based on your inputs and your outputs, uh, develop some, some full workflows. So very small timeline, but the company was created nine years ago, um, starting from scratch. And the goal was to propose some um, a new generation of image processing tools. And that's uh, how two years after we had the first version of the library, which uh, well, the main goal was an optimized library in image processing that was available in Python and C++, Windows and Linux. And what that was able to be compliant with the, with the de facto standards nowadays in image processing. When I say de facto standard is very big data sets uh, with very strong workstations with a lot of CPUs. And the goal was really to, to handle and to be able to use all of these capabilities. Four years after, uh, there was a, a demand to get a graphical user interface, to be able to visualize easily the results of any algorithm. Uh, so that's how um, we propose uh, this graphical user interface on top of IPSDK. So to propose a product as IPSDK Explorer. And so what is interesting, it's an open source graphical user interface. It means that you can use it, modify it, change it, adapt it. You can also get inspired by it if you want to create your own application. And we, to, to help also those who are not familiar with Python coding, we propose this automatic Python script generator, which will permit you to develop full Python scripts without writing a single code line. So I will show you that later on. Um, a little more than one year ago, so in 2020, we also continue enhancing um, uh, the product with proposing some machine learning features, um, machine learning. So two main aspects of machine learning, one is, which is segmentation, uh, quite of, most of the time it's a bottleneck in, um, in image processing. Uh, so goal is to propose and to, to I would say to ease this, uh, this very complex step, uh, either for very complex cases, when you have a lot of data sets to manipulate or very, very, very complex uh, ways of making some segmentation, but also for those who like myself um, are not directly experts, but well, that's what I called uh, uh, machine learning and segmentation for dummies. Another tool that is very interesting and it's, um, it's not, so well uh, proposed, I guess um, there are not so many tools that propose that, is also a machine learning to make the classification. So segmentation is not the only, only it's a bottleneck, okay, but it's not the, the definite result. The result of the segmentation is not the final result. Then you still need to clean it, Still, you still need to make a lot of image processing, uh, filtering and so on. And at the end, you get some very nice objects, but you want to classify them. And once, sometimes you just need to use based on, I don't know, the surface, circularity or whatever, but sometimes you also need to, to manipulate a lot of data and maybe some intensity or some channels or whatever. So that's a very important tool, uh, which is about, um, about this machine learning. So, as I said, IPSDK, so um, I will not go too deep in details, but you have all the tools that are necessary to make some image processing, going from filtering to make some, well, enhancing the data sets, all your data sets, depending on the, on the techniques, depending on, on the acquisition device. Most of the times you will always get some artifacts and you will, first step will need, you'll need to make some, some filtering uh, data set enhancement. So we have all the tools going from, let's say, basic ones to very advanced ones, uh, all about thresholding, as I said. So uh, going from manual, automatic, adaptative, or even machine learning now. Uh, well, other many other tools and also all about measurements to, well, the main goal of, uh, of image processing is to get results and to get outputs and to get spreadsheets, not only to, to play with pixels. Your goal is really to get results. And this tool is available, as I said previously, Python, C++, Windows, Linux, and very important, exhaustive documentation. All our algorithms are um, linked to a publication, or at least all the ones that have been uh, published. Um, and the goal is really so that you can, when you make, a, um, when you want to publish a paper, you can really say on which publication are the results documented. We don't want to be a black box at all. And main difference between IPSDK and any other tool, it's the speed. So the speed is, uh, well, IPSDK is much faster um, than any other tool. So uh, what's interest? Interest is, well, first of all, you can perform more analysis in the same amount of time. Okay, you, you increase your, let's say, your return on investment or number of analysis, uh, but you can also uh, access to much more time consuming algorithms. And in that case, you can, uh, 
increase the quality in the same, same amount of time. So here is a, um, a direct example of uh, how time can be very uh, well enhanced in, um, in IPSDK. So this was an Aviso uh, workflow and uh, translating, uh, I'm not saying about uh, optimizing or I'm not saying about changing uh, elements, really translating this graphical interface um, into code lines. We could simplify the process just because it's much more readable. So it's one line, one operation. And second thing, we could really dramatically uh, reduce the time of computation, going down from four and a half hours down to 20 minutes. So 13 times faster in that case. So the graphical user interface, uh, how does it look like? So as you will see just after, you got on the right panel, you got all the, all the chapters, all the algorithms that are available in, uh, in IPSDK. You also, that's also where you will find your own process, your own scripts. Main panel will be, of course, the images. And on the left, right, on left part, you will see all the thumbnails which represent all the outputs of every single, uh, every individual algorithm. And once you obtain the, um, your final result, you can get your measurements, stretches, which you can sort, you can get some histograms, you can make some filtering and so on. But you can, what, that's what is very nice, you can, using just your right click, generate a complete script and with generating this complete script, you will get a full script reproducing all the steps, all the relevant steps, all the, let's say, useless tests will not be saved, will not be recorded. So you will see segmentation, then a watershed to separate object, then creating a label, and then getting your, um, your spreadsheet. So how does it look like in real life? So you can see, once again, the same type of elements. So you will get the chapters on the right panel, your thumbnails on the left panel, your image here in the here in the in the middle, and you can call directly. So if we go on that, you can go from filtering and make maybe uh, so we can sort it in two D or in three D. So I will just remain here in two D. So you can just call. You you select the image that you want to analyze. You can, if needed, you can perform a preview to see the result of the parameters. And then you will go little by little uh, doing, so you first uh, filtering, then you can make a segmentation. So now I will do, so we can either go through the chapters or using the search bar. You can make, so your computation, I will, I'm looking for the light elements. And then you can create your, uh, make your separation. So I will really do something very basic. I will detect directly go directly to get my, uh, so image one. Oops, sorry. What, sorry, it's not the right, uh, right one, binary, sorry, here it is, labels. And then on top of that, if you want, you can make your label analysis where you can define the type of measurement that you, you are interested in. So you will define, so roughly one, one measurement will be one column in your spreadsheet. So you can look for them. And then if you want to make a label analysis, you can just go using that. And you can see that you will get a direct connection between the spreadsheet and, and the, the display window. You can also sort all the elements from the, the biggest one to the smallest one. You can generate some histograms where you can also define um, where you can also define some minimum and maximum value. So you can play with histograms. You can also, if we go on the, um, on the elements, you can also play with some uh, filtering. And you can see where in that case, I'm working with, um, with the surface and you can have this preview to see which, so all the, all the particles in white will be the ones that will be removed. And so once it's done, you can then directly, if you want, make a right click, generate complete script, and you will see all the steps that I've just recreated. So you get everything to be either exported and you can export it as a script, and then you can call it from any other tool that will be compliant with Python, or you can edit a macro. So it's going on my second screen. And then you can create, let's say, uh, so today we are, um, 7th of February. 
and you can create your own uh, your own script if needed you can also add some well you can completely uh, change and add some elements so it's a real console and you can create it and now we can see that we have our macro that has been directly created and once again you can still get what is inside if you want to tune it so that's what the topic behind that let's delete all the images and now if i want i can just replay it okay what's here good I must have made something wrong okay so well that, that's that's the idea so now if we if we go with that so uh, yes if we go with that, now we can also have um, another way of using uh, the scripts, which are um, the macro interface. So uh, can we go on that? So let's open an image. So if you have some type of fires and you want to analyze them, maybe it would be too frightening or maybe too complex to go and to have a look here in, uh, in all this list. So now we can propose an access uh, using uh, some Python uh, macro interface. So you can just call the script from this interface and you can, well, in that case, we could define uh, a folder, an input folder, depending the type of fiber that we are looking for. And then we can go on this current image. So it's processing. And then you can get your result. Uh, so let's just skip that. So you can get your image, you can put them in overlay, you can still play with that. New feature that we just implemented is now you can play. Uh, and if you want to save this image, so that's uh, that's an image. If you have a look here below, you can see that it's a, it's um, it's a RGB image, three values, but you have an overlay. But if you want to, to how to say, to save uh, the display of this image, now we have this. Um, new image creation, which is roughly a copy of what, what is presented, displayed. And you can see that now everything is only one, it's only one single image where everything has been merged. So that's one way. Another thing that is very interesting is that when you go with this uh, new type of access of the macros, you, we can have much more elements. We can be much more, uh, let's say, um, directive in terms of usage. And we can also add some, um, some combination of results and we can really customize our results. So we can have, uh, of course, a spreadsheet, but we can also display multiple type of uh, histograms with, in that case, cum accumulated uh, fiber lens, some, some, I would say, a classical histogram on fiber lens and so on. So that's really another way of uh, accessing and easing the, the user experience um, within IPSDK. We also integrated and still made some improvement in the machine learning part. So let's go on the machine learning. So I will create a new model. Uh, okay, let's go here. So as you can see, I have my image in my graphical user interface uh, window for the machine learning. So what we integrated now is when you have let's say uh, always the same type of element that you want to analyze uh, or at least always the same list of classes or list of of uh, material classes that you would like to use we can now call a previous one and it will call all the different um, classes that are integrated with their color and also with their names so we can still continue as a, as previously so to tag some pixels so we integrated also a display context on top of um, of this element, so we can change. If needed, you can change the graphical user um, the display. But what you can do now, so we can still detect, so define some kernels. You can define is it in two D or in three D, and which is quite complementary with what Vedvana just said previously. Sometimes it's interesting to work pixel per pixels, but sometimes you would like to go uh, maybe with um, to increase the neighbor or to not only to check pixel per pixel, but to check what is around the pixel. So we can also play with multiple resolution and playing with multiple resolution. That's roughly what was explained when you divide by two, by three, by four, whatever the size of the data sets. So 
You can define them. You can get all the list of features that will be computed. And now you can just say, okay, I want to define my background and what was integrated in the latest version of IPSDK. Previously, you only had the pencil. Now we can also define some areas with some polyline objects. We also integrate an undo button, which was quite frustrating. If, we, if, you, had, well, if you had made a mistake, you didn't want just to go to with a rubber. And we, you can then continue and saying, okay, my layer, so we just increase a little my, my elements. Okay, so you can increase that. You can say, well, my internal phase, here it is. And you can see that automatically, just with very few clicks, you will make a, um, a segmentation. You can still now also use maybe some pixels here to say, okay, I have the, here this um, internal interlayer element. And you can see directly that once again, with very few clicks, you can get a quite nice result. Um, another thing that we integrated still to use a graphical user experience. So you can now have the probability mask. A probability mask, what it is, is just to say, okay, you get very nice results, okay, you, but you don't really know when you, when you see a result for one pixel, you don't really know, is it accurate or not in terms of classification? So now we propose this probability mask, which will show you what is 100% accurate and what maybe you will need to have some, a little more inspection on that. So you can see, so let me just enhance a little my screen, okay. So you can see here that I have here a value of 100%. There is no doubt this, this element was really well classified. And then if you go a little more in detail, you can see that here maybe this, this pixel is only 35% of accuracy. As I have four classes, by default, before making any computation, every, every pixel had 25% of chance to be in any class. So we are 35%, maybe it's not too, um, how to say, um, a huge um, classification. So now we can just maybe say, okay, these pixels are in class one and we can then define and increase the quality of the results. So that's a really nice improvement. We can still see here the percentage of importance of every feature. So machine learning sometimes is kind of a black box. We don't really know what is performed inside. In that case, you can see everything that is inside. And you can say, for instance, maybe all the ones that are less than 0.1%, they are useless. So you can just remove them. And if we remove them and we go back to the features, you can see that Laplacian in, with a kernel one, um, uh, well, uh, half kernel one, so one pixel around my, my defined pixel, will not be used. Same for IPass and so on. So you can continue like that and you will save time of computation. You will also save um, memory of, of computation, which is, which is very important. Um, if you are interested then just to, maybe you just had one image to, um, to compute and you didn't want to bother with all about segmentation, you can also export directly the result to the explorer element. And then you can see that you get directly <clears throat> the prototyping result inside it. So, uh, that's how it works. Now, if you want to call your machine learning from um, from the main panel to reuse it on another another data set, maybe you can now either call the smart classification, so uh, sorry, smart segmentation, and you can call just your um, your model where it is. Where is my model? Model here it is. Or you can also use the same thing if you want to get the probability mask. What is very new, we integrated a memory ratio. So just let me go back to my presentation, um, which is very important because most of the times in machine learning, uh, everything is hidden. We don't really know what happens uh, in the middle. So you get an image, an input data set, you get an output data set. So that's very nice. You apply your machine learning. Uh, and there is some computation. You don't really know what's happening, but you get a nice result. Problem is, let's say that you have a one gigabyte data set in the, as an input, you get one gigabyte data set as an output. Okay, good. You need two, two gigabytes. But maybe uh, to get this using the machine learning, you may have 10 or maybe um, 100 
maybe 100 of uh, intermediate features. So it means that everyone will be uh, consuming one gigabyte in memory. So uh, if you have one gigabyte, one gigabyte plus 100 gigabytes, you will need a one gigabyte machine memory. If you don't have it, data set will be too big and your machine will crash. So you will not be able to go from one to one. So what we integrate in IPSDK is, okay, we will, before making the computation, we will check uh, the maximum capability of your machine. And if everything can be managed from 100%, okay, good. If not, IPSDK will automatically compute the best sub region, the best sub data set to, be, to perform um, the machine learning model on it. So you will go on that. And then little by little, you will be able to reconstruct kind of a stitching, let's say, to reconstruct the final result. And uh, so in that case, your machine, your machine will not crash because automatically you will just minimize data set uh, of computation at any time. And other things, since we are, all, all the features are using and relying on IPSDK um, algorithms, then of course it will be, um, uh, I would say very, very fast. So let's go back here. So that's why we integrated. Uh, so as I said, it's automatic, but most of the times you will not be running only IPSDK in a machine, or maybe you will be sharing your data set or your machine with other users. So you will not get 100% of uh, capabilities available for IPSDK. Um, but IPSDK will just check the hardware, uh, hardware configuration. So it doesn't know if it's shared or not. That's why you can now create this memory allocation and maybe say, I just want to use 50% of my capabilities. So that's really a way, so I say 50 could be 30% or whatever, but that's really the idea. You can really um, customize uh, the maximum usage of your, um, of your, um, of your machine in um, using, the, um, how to say, using um, the machine learning features. We apply it, okay, I get my result. Just move this one. And if you want now to make a label analysis to get some measurements, um, here it is. I just applied a uh, surface ratio, uh, but you can see that now uh, all the name of the classes uh, that you, here it is, name of the classes that you applied in your machine learning will be also used in, um, in the results and in the, in the spreadsheet. So there is a real, uh, we'll, we'll not get only uh, some ID one, two, and three, you will get real names. And in that case, we can see that very fast. The layer in blue, which is 16% of, uh, of my image and so on, 60% six um, which is internal and so on. So, um, so that's it for, um, for the machine learning. Um, another thing that is very interesting is, um, let me show you some, um, some images. It's watershed. You know, uh, quite often we speak about watershed. And watershed is um, a very, very interesting tool. Uh, let me check my uh, data set. Okay. So watershed, so if you have a type of images and if you want to, to make a separation, what you will do is you will make your watershed. Um, you will make, so I'll go directly to labels. Let me use a classical usage and you will cut your elements and you will separate objects. Good. But you can see that here we have big particles, a U shape, um, but maybe these shapes we would like to separate them. So we can see the dilatation factor is not maybe good enough. So let's try to, okay, now we can separate them, but we, we lose this U shape. If we can maybe try three, we have the U shape, but once again, we lose some separation. So that's that's a problem uh, because let me just show you how it works. So as you may have seen, so let me just redo that. If you just use a question mark, you will go directly to the documentation. So when you go there, you can see that how it how it's how is watershed running. So you will detect your elements. You will get all your um, based on the distance map. You will get your maximum peaks in terms of distance map. And then you will just apply a dilatation factor to cut the objects. But 
it's very good when all the objects are roughly the same size and, and when they are all um, with circular shapes, which is not the case here in my, in my element and which is not the case here in my image. So as you, just as a reminder, either you can cut all the elements, but if you cut all the elements, as I said, you lose your U shape. So what would be interesting would be to get something that will not be the same parameter for everyone. So that's when we integrated and we developed. So it's um, it's a it will be um, so it's, we already made an article on LinkedIn on that, but that's what we call the um, um, adaptive watershed. Um, and the idea is in that case you don't use um, you don't use uh, um, a fixed value, but you will use um, a percentage value. So that's why now you don't see an integer. You can get an element, so let's go on 60%, and then I will show you how it works. And you can see that here I can cut my object and I remain my U shape. How is it working? The idea is to get, an, I will show you here also, you get a distance map on your object, and you can see some maximum, some peaks here. And what you will do is you will apply a percentage it is, and you will apply an, a percentage on, since here it is, based on these peaks. And in that case, you will never apply exactly the same value. So the bigger your distance map, I would say you will go with more distance in terms of, uh, of neighborhood to make this uh, separation. But of course, you will be able in that case with a U shape to see all the, all the small individual distance map and you will never cut them. So that's the idea. Let me go back here. So it's, uh, it's, so it's part of IPSDK, so very new generation. And you can see here a comparison between a standard result of, uh, of classical watershed, let's say, and the adaptive watershed, which will provide you some, very, some elements that are very based on your sample. Very interesting when you have some um, um, very heterogeneous uh, elements. And so, uh, so that's why now it's not, um, it's not anymore um, a value, uh, I'd say a fixed value, but, but a percentage in terms of um, working based on the distance. Um, okay, another thing that is very, uh, very new in IPSDK is, let me just clear it on my, my memory, which is, and you are most of, you uh, facing that. So I will show you an example in 2D, but it would be the same in, in 3D, is when you have that type of data set. So in that case, it's for our life sciences, but if we go through with my mouse through the, through the, the image, you can see here below that it's, a, it's, well, it's a color image, RGB image, but if you have a look, we have four values. Why? Just because in fact, this image is not, um, it's not um, a classical RGB image. It's it's uh, it's based on four channels, so that integrates in IPSDK the multi-channel, multi-spectral, multi-energy. So depending on the tool that you are using, you may not have uh, you may not have the same vocabulary, but the idea is that you can combine several channels. And even though we can only display three, uh, well, it's, that's a limitation of the operating systems. Even though we can display three. All the computations that we may do, machine learning, for instance, will be relying on more channels than the ones that are displayed. Or change the channel selector, you can say, okay, my red channel I will apply, so in that case it's channel zero, but I could apply channel three, and you may see that um, the, the, um, the display is changing. Okay, let me go back. So you can completely tune that and define how you want to display that. Um, you can also uh, create your own, so in that case, it was a pre-constructed um, element, but you can just using uh, uh, the mouse, you can make, create a multi-channel image based in that case, based on these three first ones. So that's really another way of, um, of displaying and manipulating data sets. You can completely um, create, manipulate, uh, take advantage of all the all the channels. You can, as I said, you can also 
created in um, where is my sorry I'm just closing this one so if I want to create um, just go with an additional one that I already created but if you want to go here just clean a little if we have here a look at the um, origin of interest of my previous image you can see that here I computed uh, all the elements on channel zero one two three okay so all the four channels I used to make the computation of a machine learning model so it's really com completely uh, created and if I go directly to a to, a, to the result let me go on that if I want to make my label analysis and show that I can also get information um, so I just need to put some um, information about uh, intensity but if I want to make a measurement you can see that now when I make a measurement I can get information on every channel they are really even though they are once again I insist on that even though we display only three channels the four of them I use to make the computation either for machine learning or to make the measurement we also integrated still to use a, the user experience uh, batch processing so let's go on um, on batch processing let's say that you have an image like this and if you want to, well, you create, a, let's say, your script, which will give you an image, a result, and you get a spreadsheet, okay? But you may have several images. So I just created a folder uh, with four of these images. And if you, you want to do that, you have now this new icon on which you can click. You can define which will be, so uh, the folder, input folder, it automatically creates a batch result folder. You can change the name if you want, and you can also merge your results in one single spreadsheet. And when you apply it, so all the images will be computed, <clears throat> you will get so the result, here it is. And you can see that you get the image, the four images in, uh, in terms of results. So let's open them. You can see them opened. You can get an Excel file with, with all the elements on which image is it uh, computed. And you can also get the XML, XML files, which are the spreadsheets. You can open them in IPSDK. And uh, let me show you that. And now you can also, um, Yes, they are. So now you can also um, combine them just by um, control and, uh, and left click and now create a multi analysis spreadsheet. So it's up in here on my second screen. And you can see now that you will get the result of your, um, of your computation based not only on one image, but based on all the images. So you can get here 2.5 thousand uh, elements. And you can, if I go on surface, for instance, I can get an histogram, not only relying on one image, but really merging all the results, merging all the, um, well, all, all the features, all the measurement on all the data sets. So that's really another way of, um, of making some, well, batch processing when you have really want to, you've made a batch of acquisition, you can directly go on that. Um, another tool that is, um, let's say, related to, to, to what the runner just uh, showed just before myself, uh, which is detection of lines. So in that case, it's working on, on, on the line, but that's um, a ridge line technique. So the idea, if you want to get this interface between these two elements, in that case, there is only one line. Of course, if you had several lines, you could make also some type of masks. But what we would, would like to say, if we want to get this interface um, line, we may say, well, okay, I want to make a gradient. Okay, but on that, I get my two images, I'll just remain this one. Uh, and I will just transform it to um, positive values, just to ease the uh, computation. But you can see that now I, I would like to get this white peak line or interface line. So now I can just use a ridge line function ridge line function that will permit you to detect either am I looking for 
dark or white or light intensity. In my case, it's a light intensity. I am going from left to right or right to left. So that's what we call direct or reverse. And will it be in X or Y axis? And then you can just compute it and you will find, so let me go back and just to show you the display. So you can get your line and you will get also the list of points that you can use or export or whatever uh, to detect all the elements on that. Um, still in the same philosophy, we can also um, play with some type of, uh, let me go back with this previous image, some tortuosity. So you may want to make some, um, yes, to make some tortuosity, which is um, well, uh, well demanded. Um, so once you get a label image, you can now use, once again, tortuosity, and you can define, is it in X or Y direction? Is it in straight or reverse, um, reverse uh, computation? And you can see here that we have a 353, which is a minimum length of propagation. And you can get um, the lookup table to get, um, to show uh, how it's going through through the image. Um, I'm quite finishing my uh, my presentation. We also have uh, so as you say as as you know. Um, so we we display so we can manage. So I show you because of my laptop. I presented you mainly some two D images, but we can also work with three D data sets. So as a reminder, we don't propose any 3D visualization. We will propose it uh, slice by slice, which will permit you, um, if you want to see what, what you are doing precisely, if you want to make, let's say here in that case, a threshold, you can really see pixel per pixel, what are the edges, which are the pixels that you are remaining or not. So which is much more efficient than doing that in the 3D visualization because the 3D rendering will always have the, the tendency to, to smooth the edges. So you never know, are you looking pixel per pixel? Or are you looking in the middle of the pixels? So that's um, how, we, how we do. But once you have made your computation, so I already did this computation. So once you have made your, uh, your computation, uh, what could be interesting maybe is just to make um, a very brief visualization. We are we are mainly a tool to make computation, not to make visualization. But you could do some um, um, sorry, extract. Uh, so in that case, it's in three D extract, and you can get um, a surface rendering. Uh, so it's very basic, but it, it will permit you to to, to be sure that. What you are, uh, what you were detecting, uh, well, corresponds really to what you were expecting at the very beginning. So, let me just finish with this. So, uh, just to go back with speed and machine learning. So, uh, I guess I already presented that, and Shifali was co-presenting with me last year. But just as a reminder, with machine learning she could achieve 400 times faster using IPSDK than uh, scikit-learn for the same data set, for a small data set, which was only a one megabyte data set, but with 15 gigabyte data set, she was not able to detect it or to make the computation with scikit-learn, but it, she was able to do that you know, through IPSDK, thanks to this optimization. Uh, okay, so that's a smart classification topic. So just same philosophy as a segmentation. So I will not go too deep in detail, but same thing just based on metrics. And you can then make the classification and get, um, uh, well, classification directly. If you want to get more information, so of course we will be available in the afternoon, but uh, you can follow us. We try to be uh, very active. Uh, furthermore, since we, we are obliged to go only through online events, we cannot really meet together. So, um, so it's very nice. As Alexander said, uh, we can address much more persons, but uh, well, uh, physical meetings are also missing. So, uh, but you can still continue following us. So through our website, uh, so uh, reactiveip.com, but you can also follow us through LinkedIn. Uh, we just created the Twitter channel um, and some uh, tutorials. So um, a lot of our um, new features 
uh, usages and so on are also on our YouTube channel. And most of the time it's something like two or three minutes uh, just to show you how it works. And also on our website, we have, um, we have many, um, uh, well, many examples, uh, many scripts also to share with you. So, well, thank you for your attention. I see one question in the chat. Uh, uh, I think it's even from our next speaker. I just read it quickly. Uh, could you please explain how your software compares to Elastic, which is free? Yeah, sure. So um, we get, well, so let me just go back here, well, or even though here in this, this part, but um, we completely get inspired by Elastic. So um, let me go back here. If I can find my, uh, I have some hidden slides. <laughs> so, uh, uh, here it is again. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the ID is for us. Oh, I cannot find it. So, the ID for us is to to optimize what already exists. So, go here. So, our graphical user interface. Uh, the one that I really presented you very fast, is uh, really relying on what exists and to take all the good ideas and try to optimize it. So main difference with Elastic, we focus completely in the machine learning part, uh, minimizing the number of clicks and improving the speed. But of course, uh, if you already know Elastic, uh, you will not be lost using IPSDK. Our main focus is optimizing memory, optimizing uh, speed. But we took we took a really uh, everything. Well, a, a, we we also have another example with um, electronic microscopy uh, for the VSNR filtering, and in that case we completely um, let's say transposed and completely um, translated the, um, an image plugin into IPSDK. So that's that our strengths optimizing things. But we of course uh, everything that is in. Um, in how to say um, in open source, um, well, open source and image elastic and so on. It's coming from from new persons from the scientific community and from researchers. Our goal is really to optimize it so that you can get a, a technical support, so that you can get all of that. And well, and if you have, of course, any very specific question or very uh, specific topic that you want to discuss, then we we can discuss later in the afternoon or after the event. No problem. Thanks. I think that was the only question and uh, David was happy with your answer, <laughs> what I see in the chat. Um, <laughs> to stay a bit in time, I would say we, we swap now. We are almost perfect in schedule. And, and again, there will be opportunity in the afternoon during the uh, breakout session to discuss more in detail and exchange. Um, so for uh, thanks again for a nice presentation. Uh, uh, very impressive. We Again, switch now to the last presentation of this morning session. It's uh, David Rousseau, also who joins this tutorial now since several years, almost many years. Uh, uh, typically, I'm very happy that he joins because he puts a dedicated focus on machine learning and uh, uh, deep learning. Uh, very hot topics, very important. And uh, I'm very happy that again this year he joins again, again, again. This will be a presentation or an introduction in the morning with a breakout session in the afternoon uh, where you hopefully can uh, discuss more in a lively atmosphere. So I've stopped talking. Uh, David, thanks. Uh, this is your slot. Thank you, Alexander. And thanks to uh, all participants for uh, being part of this uh, uh, online uh, event. So uh, I am working at University of Angers, indeed, and we are happy to, to, to contribute each year for uh, several years to this, uh, to this meeting. I'll be giving the talk today with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ali, uh, Ali Ahmad. So we have uh, uh, two contributions this morning and Ali will be online with you this afternoon for more uh, hands-on. So basically you had already a demo of, uh, of machine learning oriented uh, software that was uh, the previous talks. And also there was a talk uh, on uh, fiber uh, analysis where in the end there was some uh, mentioning about uh, UNET uh, network. So I, I would like to, to uh, as a teaching research staff to, to give you uh, some insight on how uh, these techniques work and possibly indicate you, that's my main message that maybe it's possible for you to, to put your end uh, 
uh, directly in the code because that's not that uh, uh, difficult if you want to have a full uh, uh, understanding of what's going on. Uh, so that's the, the point of my, my talk. So this deep learning that we are uh, talking a, a lot about uh, is, a, is a revolution uh, indeed because uh, it's shifting from a, a machine learning classical approach where you select features like uh, was uh, shown in the previous talks where you, you would select Laplacians, Asians, uh, different shapes in your, uh, uh, in your image and then uh, uh, ask for a classification to, to produce a segmentation. In deep learning, you will have an end-to-end -end learning, meaning that the best features that discriminate your object from your background uh, and the later uh, classification will be optimized in an end-to-end -end fashion. There, is, there are consequences consequences of this because in the past there was a jungle of algorithm for each individual single uh, traits to be extracted so that's for instance a, 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 a type of view for um, uh, plant image analysis that we are uh, care uh, uh, about in my in my group um, and uh, somehow in the deep learning era there will be actually very few uh, networks a very few uh, uh, algorithms. So basically, you just have to uh, translate your biological or material question into something which is more expressed in terms of information. So, do you care about a classification, meaning you take an image and you uh, can give an output like healthy, non healthy, uh, normal, abnormal, or whatever uh, number of class you, you, you have? Uh, do you care about object detection, meaning uh, being able to, uh, to to determine the bonding box or uh, the the round surrounding the, the, the an object, or do you care uh, about a, um, a segmentation, meaning having each single pixel in your image being uh, labeled uh, into belonging uh, to a, a given class of object? Okay, so basically, if you can express your problem into classification, object detection, and segmentation, you see that behind these, there is actually a few set of distinct uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm in terms of, uh, of deep learning, and that the problems becomes actually pretty uh, pretty easy to, 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 to solve. You just have to select the, the right type of, uh, of algorithm. So for instance, if you have salads, uh, you want to select, discriminate salads from weeds. Uh, so basically this is a classification. You take one uh, network. If you care about healthy or unhealthy leaves, you can take the same architecture basically. So the type of um, uh, image, if they are RGB or 3D and so on are the, are the same. You just take the, the, you can just consider the same architecture and then fine tune adapts the uh, hyperparameter of the method. The consequences of this is that you can solve this kind of problem in, a couple of days actually and uh, we've been running this kind of uh, approach uh, to train people rather than to ask them to uh, to invest in uh, some uh, finalized uh, uh, software for uh, some years we are involved in this uh, EMBL uh, short training for uh, four years now with uh, Anna Krish Cook uh, and people from uh, from my group and in a couple of days, let's say five five days, we can solve almost any problem, even with biologists not specialists in a, in a machine or deep learning. But uh, we are eager to to code a bit to uh, to solve their problems. And in groups like mine, actually, we are kind of agnostic in terms of application problems. So we can uh, solve some plant science, bioimaging, medical imaging problem because the skills you have can be applied to any kind of uh, uh, of um, of objects uh, because uh, again the, the architecture are the same so is it the end of history actually no there are still a lot of investigation on new architecture uh, in deep learning but we can still uh, start to play with the one which are in our hands uh, in our group uh, we use actually existing uh, architecture and more care about uh, the bottlenecks uh, you have in the world of deep learning because in the world of deep learning you need to have a lot of data to be annotated because you have to uh, adjust all the parameters of your algorithm and we develop um, uh, automatic annotation uh, tools and that was part of the, the work of uh, Ali Ahmad in his PhD to have a, a micro virtual imaging uh, platform which has been developed in, uh, at Creatis to to simulate uh, 2D or 3D uh, images of synthetic uh, data, which are automatically uh, annotated. 
tasks. So you save a lot of time uh, so that the machine can learn from synthetic data and then apply or transfer to real ones. Let me go uh, shortly uh, back to some uh, basics of how deep learning uh, uh, works so that you can then better understand where we will put your end in the codes with, uh, with Ali. So basically, uh, most of the, these codes work in a supervised fashion, meaning that you have example input uh, X and you have output Y. So the input X can be images or can be pixels and the output can be uh, labels typically. Uh, and so what you will uh, do when you train a, a machine uh, in uh, deep learning or even standard machine learning will be to adjust a function f w so that when you feed the machine with x then it can predict y uh, the uh, the output that you, you would expect to have so to to do this the machine needs to be trained on exam examples so that's the annotation that you will have to uh, to, to to provide and uh, then it's a, it ends up in an optimization uh, problem where all the W parameters, the, the hyper parameters of the, the machine will be optimized so that the prediction by the machine will fit to the ground truths that you uh, associated to, to it. So I, I, I could go in more detail on how this optimization is done. Basically, it's a, it's a gradient descent. So we, are, we, we, uh, we make local derivative of the, the function we want to, uh, to optimize. And we adjust uh, the, the weight automatically uh, in order to reach the, uh, the, a kind of stable, um, uh, of stable uh, function or solution. Uh, what I can uh, do to, 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 to illustrate this is to, to play a bit with this nice uh, interface called um, uh, TensorFlow Playground, which illustrates what's happening in a neural network where you, you train it for a, a specific task. So here it will be a classification. So uh, I will start with a, with a single neuron. So here a single neuron. And I will ask the, 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 neuro, the neuron to classify uh, pixels or um, um, instance here, which is for a binary classification, uh, guessing if we are on the blue uh, class or the uh, orange one. So orange could be normal uh, instance or normal images, and blue could be uh, abnormal images. So when you do uh, this, you, you feed with features. So here it's the position in the, in the feature space, and you will ask the, the neuron to adjust its weights. So what it's doing is just a, a weighted sum passed uh, to uh, uh, a nonlinear uh, threshold in order to take a decision. So for instance, I will take this one more uh, and, uh, and ask the neuron to, to train and it, it guess automatically that it should give almost uh, uh, an equal value to the position X and uh, horizontal and vertical in order to take a decision to guess if we are belonging to the orange or blue uh, or blue class. To do this, it's optimizing what is called a, a, a loss function. So that's the, the, the function I was uh, uh, describing just, uh, just before. And we, you can see that already for this problem, a single neuron is doing the job correctly. You can just then move to another problem like this one and maybe uh, guess that the features you are providing are maybe not optimal, meaning that if I train this neuron, the solution uh, will be pretty bad. You can see the, the, the value of the, of the loss function are, are not that, uh, that good here. Maybe by using uh, some uh, features which are pretty uh, closer to what you, uh, you would uh, expect, you will get better results. And this is indeed what's happening here. So I'm cheating a bit while doing this because I'm selecting a feature which is exactly what I'm looking for. So the, the real situation is more to uh, like we had in the previous talks to, to uh, and we do in Elastic, you, you select many features and you ask the machine to select automatically which is the one and blindly, which is the one which is the most adapted to your, uh, to your situation. So now we, have a, we start to have kind of artificial intelligence because for uh, different problems, uh, which are all of the same uh, kinds, uh, you have a binary classification and a single machine is able, capable of solving uh, the, the different problem, but of the same informational uh, kind uh, in this way. 
However, if the feature space is a bit too complex, the machine, the single machine itself, the single neuron itself, uh, may not have enough features or enough uh, uh, expressiveness uh, by its single threshold, and by only linearly com combining all the features we have, might not be able to to, to adapt its its feature space or its decision making into a too complex uh, uh, environment. So this is where actually adding more neurons and more layers of neurons uh, can help in uh, determining and uh, uh, in making a, a decision that will have enough expressiveness uh, to, to solve uh, your, your problem. So here, I'm increasing the number of uh, layers of uh, neurons. Each single neuron make a weighted sum of what it uh, receives and provided a thresholded version uh, to the next layer of, uh, of neurons. So you can see that progressively uh, you get to a kind of stability of the of the answer, which might not be exactly uh, perfect uh, here, but which is in the deep layers actually guessing the kind of uh, uh, dictionary of shape that it's uh, expecting. So that basically to uh, in a couple of uh, minutes in a nutshell to uh, give you a, a feeling of uh, how these uh, systems are working, they are more or less optimizing all the weights in order to take a final decision, which is fitting to the example that you, uh, you fitted. You can see that there are some uh, hyperparameters that I did not go through, like the number of epochs, so how long you train your machine, how, how fast the machine uh, learns, uh, the activation function, which corresponds to the non-linearity of the, the model, uh, and some yeah, hyperparameters that are actually uh, easy to be tuned and can in most of the time be uh, okay with uh, by default uh, version of these uh, parameters as provided by the libraries that you can use. Okay, uh, so we could play for hours with this. I will skip these, uh, these, these slides and you, you get the, the essence of what it's doing. So here, basically optimizing the linear combination of the local information coming from the input data. When you deal with images, these local information are basically some image in the uh, image and you provide, the, you optimize the, the kernel of convolution that you do on, a, on, on an image. So if we come back to the idea that we actually need very few algorithms, if you care about classification, you will find this kind of uh, architectures like this uh, LeNet uh, architecture, which is uh, uh, dated back from 1998, uh, VGG16, which is basically exactly the same as uh, LeNet, but with a, a, a larger amount of layers. So here in this image, you have the uh, each small image uh, corresponds to a neuron, and then each uh, uh, layer corresponds to another set of uh, these uh, layer of these um, of these neurons. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers of uh, of neurons. You can see that there is a max pooling effect reduction of uh, the dimension in order to incorporate more uh, context when you take the final decision in the end. But basically, all the architecture looks the uh, uh, look the same. They have more or less uh, number of layers. There are some kind of tricks, but which are kind of advanced modes that you don't need really to 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 know to to really uh, uh, get the, the the point here. For object recognition, uh, it's also using the similar uh, uh, techniques uh, like uh, uh, convolutions of uh, of concatenated layers of uh, of neurons. And in this case, it's not learning to uh, to give a label to an image, but it's learning to give a, a bounding box of uh, inside of uh, of an image and the associated class inside of this uh, of this uh, bounding box. And we will care about this uh, uh, today in the hands on and in the forthcoming uh, 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 focus of uh, Ali. We can also do segmentation, and segmentation works exactly the same. It's first of all a classification neural network on the, this first side of the architecture. And then, uh, then once you have taken decision on uh, um, if each uh, single pixel belongs to a class to another uh, in a reduced dimension space, then you interpolate in order to. Uh, to provide a final uh, segmentation with the same resolution as the image you had. So that's the UNET uh, architecture that was pointed earlier in the, in the presentation. So it's basically uh, convolution, non-linearity, uh, decrease of the dimension by a factor of two, and then interpolation on the final decision to, to give a, a segmented map. There is 
2D version of, the, of it and also 3D version of, uh, of these unit uh, algorithms. All of these architectures are now uh, accessible in a variety of uh, pretty ergonomic uh, environments uh, that can come at certain cost or for free. Uh, let me share you this uh, kind of a, a view where you have a deep image, which is a, a, an inference, meaning you can just use a trained, already trained model and apply them to your images. There is Enjoy where you can use already trained, but you can also apply them directly uh, train them again to, on your images. NIME is doing uh, uh, similar uh, stuff, but you are also a uh, commercial solution like the one we had just uh, uh, before, more for shallow learning so far, but also the Nikon uh, software, the Leica software. And uh, this afternoon, we will be playing with the uh, uh, zero cost deep learning for Mike, a uh, nice academic initiative where you can not only use already trained models, but you can also retrain them on uh, the Google uh, Colab uh, platform or on your own um, uh, computer if you're interested. So uh, I'm giving the mic to uh, uh, Ali, who will give a, a focus on this uh, unit that I introduced uh, very uh, uh, shortly. Please, Ali, take the the floor. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. So I will share my screen. I will just go back to talk a bit about, to refine a few points about deep learning that uh, David already pointed during the presentation. So I will just present myself. I will open my camera. This is Ali Ahmad. Actually, I am a research engineer at uh, INRAE of uh, Pays de la Loire in France. Um, I'm working in the development of a deep learning algorithm for uh, applied for plant science to do classification, segmentation, denoising, and etc. I will just uh, point some, I will talk uh, a bit generally about the deep learning. We know that uh, we are using deep learning daily. We are using that by when we are sending mails, for example, we have the, we, we can see that we have some spams that comes to our mail. This is the deep learning. We are also using that in the speech recognition, the natural language processing when you use the Google Translate in Netflix when we are at home and other technologies used in imaging devices also in our phones when we are taking photos. There are some applications based on deep learning and also there are several features application of deep learning to in the, in the, in the I mean the self-driving cars or uh, crime predictions and the creation of perfumes and etc. Uh, the deep learning specially used for image analysis. I will revisit this chart here uh, of the application of deep learning on, on the image analysis. We can do different type of application going from the classifications, the segmentation, the tracking and the reconstruction of images. We saw this morning that we have a lot of uh, application in 3D imaging. So there are also 3D reconstruction of the image, 3D segmentation, tracking, and the classification. And there were also a lot of algorithms that were developed to do each step, to do, to, to perform in, in this, in each specific task. And we have also different categories of architectures that are mainly based on the convolutional neural network. So to just define what is a convolutional neural network, it's a type of artificial uh, neural network used for image analysis. And it is the fundamental, uh, fundamental and basic build, uh, building blocks used by the most uh, uh, deep learning image analysis architectures. So it consists of three main blocks. If you want to, to see the first block is the convolutional layer, we have different convolutional blocks where we are uh, the machine uh, configure or define randomly some uh, filters with different weights. And we ensure uh, we, we precise and we give the number of the filters that we want to define for the machine. And these sliding windows will, will scan the uh, input image and to uh, subtract some feature maps. As we can see here, we have some features, for example, some filters and the corresponding feature maps from these filters applied on one of, of the nine image of the famous MNIST data set. So this is the first, blo first block of the convolutional neural network. The second block is the max pooling or the pooling layer where we will be 
we will do down sampling of the feature maps to extract more complex features. And also the second advantage of this pooling layer is to reduce the size of the image. Then this means reducing the computational time, uh, the computation time. And finally, the third main layer of the CNN is the fully connected layer, which is the decision layer where we have uh, the neural network, we have the neural network, we will do the classification, for example, or we, where, where we perform the classification task to have the different outputs. I was talking that this is, the CNN was, is most used in all the application of deep, deep learning, and we'll focus now on the segmentation only. So for the segmentation, I just want to point that we have different type of segmentation. So we first, we have the semantic segmentation where we are assigning for each class, for each pixel of the original image one class. So here we will have like binary class, we'll have uh, only two classes. Each pixel will be classified to be the, uh, the background and or to be the, uh, the object inside the image. This is the semantic segmentation. However, so there are other type of the segmentation, which is the instance segmentation. So here we will not assign only two classes to each pixel, but also we'll assign a class for each segmented object inside the image, as we can see in this example. So we have two different type of this of the segmentation. The most used architectures for the segmentation. Uh, with deep learning is, uh, for example, we start with the SegNet, which is the deep convolutional encoder decoder architecture for image segmentation. And as we can see from this illustration here, we have the image volume in the output, uh, in the input, the image volume, or if we, we can use also the 2D image, we have an encoder part, which is different, which is several blocks of convolutional network several blocks of CNN. We have different convolutional layers followed by binarization layers, followed by activation functions, the ReLU act, relu activation function and pooling layers. And in this block, we will try to encode the input image into different feature maps. As we can see here, the encoder, the main function of the encoder is to transfer or to encode the input image into different feature maps according to the number of convolutional blocks that we are using and extracting, this means extracting the main features and the more most useful information from the image. The other part of the uh, segmentation of the segment, uh, segment is the decoder part. And here, as we can see here, we are reconstructing the uh, the low resolution feature maps to get at the output, the high resolution segmented image, as we can see here. So basically the decoder part is to convert the uncoded data to its original form. We convert the low resolution encoder feature maps to the full input resolution feature maps based on the max pooling indices that we were using during the encoder part. So as we can see in this example, we have the original image, for example, and the max pooling or the pooling layers, so we can use the two by two max pooling. We get the four neighbors, pixel neighbors, each four pixel neighbors, and we took the max from them. This is the encoder part, the max pooling part. So we have here five, we have six, seven, and eight. This is the max pooling part in the encoder uh, part of the uh, signet. And the other hand, and the other part, we have the max pooling or the upsampling. So we use the indices of this max pooling to, re to reconstruct the, the high resolution image from it. So as we can see here, we took the indices and then we construct the original image by putting zeros and filling the values where we have the max pooling indices. This is the encoder decoder part of the signet. We'll go to another architecture, which is the unit, which is also similar to the signet. We have encoder part, which is also known as the contraction part. And we have the expensive expansion part, which is the, which is the deco uh, decoder part. But the difference between the signet and the unit that we have a skip connection between each block of the encoder part and we transfer the feature maps to the corresponding block in the decoder part. Like that, we are uh, 
uh, like that we are creating, we are taking the information from the encoder and reinforcing the, the information in the decoder part to ha have better segmentation. So in this uh, example here, we can see that, for, uh, for example, here in the A, we have the HeLa cells segmented using the semantic segmentation. We have two binary classification or binary segmentation. We have the background and the object. In other case, we can do also the instance segmentation. We have different cells and we are assigning each clock to each cell of these, uh, uh, to these cells. So in the end here, I will uh, say that how we can uh, also, how we can evaluate our segmentation. There are different type of metrics that we can use to evaluate our, uh, the segmentation performance. There are, for example, I will just uh, talk about the Jacquard index, index or also known as the intersection of our union. So we are taking the, uh, the ratio of the area of overlap between the ground through and the result at the output of the segmentation over the area of union between them. Like that, we can compute the uh, intersection of our union. Also, there are the most used also metric for the segment to quantify the segmentation performance and the dice score, where also it's the area of overlap multiplied by two over the area of union. There are also other metrics such as the F1 score, which is closely to the Jacquard index and etc. And for these metrics, the closer of the metric to the one, then the model is more accurate, the segmentation is more efficient. Uh, in the afternoon, what we are going to see during the hands-on, we'll apply the unit to segment uh, two D, the 2D nuclei using Colab and the TensorFlow Keras libraries. So on this, uh, during the afternoon, we'll, be, uh, we'll see how we can code and implement the unit architecture uh, using, uh, using Python and notebook and how we can uh, also, how we can optimize the different hyperparameters and how we can refine the, 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 the post segmentation parameters to get the best uh, segmentation performance. Thank you. Any question? Is there any request, um, Ali, uh, for that participants will have to, uh, participants that will join will need to have created maybe um, have a, a kind of a, a account on something if they want to run on Collab, what you will uh, provide? Yeah, sure. Yeah, they will need to have a Gmail account. All that they need is to have the Gmail account. And then after in the afternoon, I will, send, I will send the link to the data. They can download them and put them in their drive. And then I will show in the afternoon how we can use them and how we can uh, start running the code. So you can use your classical one, but you can also create just one for the occasion and uh, it will only be useful for uh, the, the, the hands-on that you will, uh, we will do with you. May I just add that we are also going to do a, a collab notebooks. So um, also for, for our part, a uh, 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 G uh, or, or Google account is necessary. So I just sent the link to the data. So you have just to download the folder and unzip it. And in the afternoon, we can just drop it in the, to the drive and we can open the notebook later and show how we can use the code and read the data. Thank you, Eddie. We continue half past one, one thirty. Um, with a tutorial by Raimund Moxo. The idea is to have basically an introductory part and then after half an hour to do like a cut where people either stay in the tutorial or they go out in the breakout rooms, which we have according to the three last speakers we had. So number of participants is rather stable. I think we, we go on. Of course, it's always interesting. If you see no one to say, welcome back, but... <laughs> I hope some people are listening. Um, I'm quite happy that we have another speaker for this afternoon first, just to uh, remind or introduce everyone who's listening to the afternoon program. So after the more lecture or introduction part in, 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 the, in the morning session, the idea of the afternoon session 
is uh, uh, to, to, to be a bit more active and uh, uh, have a bit more exchange. So we will start with a half an hour lecture of Professor Raimund Moxo from DTU. Um, and then after rough, roughly half an hour, I will open, we make a short break, we make, I, I open the breakout rooms. And then depending on what your interest is, you can either stay in the session with Raimund or we have then, according to the three last speaker of the morning session, dedicated breakout rooms. As it was for QM, for the Quantitative Image Analysis Center, for Reactive IP, the software, and for the machine learning presentation of uh, University of Angers, uh, a dedicated room. So you basically choose yourself, or I mean, you can also uh, um, jump between rooms uh, 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 and try to discuss with people the, the, the specific questions you have. So um, talked enough. So I'm very happy Professor Raimund Moxo agreed again. Uh, we have a, also a re returning speaker uh, to give a tutorial about image analysis. Uh, um, and with that, the floor is yours. Ah, thank you, Alex. So <clears throat> I'm sharing the screen if all goes well now. So um, so now you see it in the wrong mode, right? No. Yes, yeah, sir. You just have to swap your display. Yeah, yeah. I just need to do that. Just a moment. So it's on the top left, sir. Yeah. Um, and no, somehow I have this. Uh, yeah, it was another thing there, so I was not sure where it is. Yes. So now you seeing it in the presentation mode. Um, I'm very happy to be again. The, the person who makes this bridge between uh, lectures and uh, tutorial hands-on se session in this user meeting. And uh, it's really great that uh, Alex again managed to organize it as every year. So, and I hope there are many of you are uh, new and some of you maybe are returning from last year or so. So, so let's go into this, uh, how we do this uh, uh, going from lectures to tutorials. So my idea here was to, uh, to make a mix a little bit. So introduce a, a few uh, scientific cases and uh, on them show you in first without, let's say your direct interaction, show a few possibilities, how we can uh, analyze the data sets and then uh, that will slowly drift towards uh, to the going to the break breakout rooms and also uh, if you uh, if you continue staying in this room then uh, there will be some basic analysis done here also so now the uh, what you see in this uh, very first uh, introduction slide you see a foam, image of a foam, a tomographic reconstruction of a foam. And uh, this image was taken uh, at the Swiss light source in the Tomcat beamline uh, some years ago already. And it's, a, it's an industrial project. Uh, it's actually a contrast agent for intestines that uh, is developed uh, for uh, clinics and now so the idea was here to characterize this uh, in terms of uh, a number of different parameters. So for example, a very simple parameter is uh, like the size distribution, volume distribution. And uh, you show, you, you see here uh, these uh, distributions for two different time steps. So these are uh, here the tomographic slices that uh, uh, I'm sure you have heard a lot about uh, in the morning. Unfortunately, I couldn't join the morning, so I, I hope I will not repeat too much from the morning session, uh, but maybe some things, uh, I guess there will be some overlap. So the, on the left, one sees uh, two time steps of the, uh, of the, uh, of the acquisition of this uh, uh, contrast agent and uh, on the on the right one see one can see the distribution that is done uh, in a quite simple way that uh, i will show later on and uh, you see this for uh, for a different 
times uh, one hour later, two hour later. So this one can see how the bubble sizes, uh, bubble volumes evolve. And so this is a this is a very simple uh, representation of the data in terms of some numbers. And these numbers is the the volume distribution or the the name then the for example the mean volume uh, at that uh, given uh, time frame. And uh, so this is this is uh, what we will be looking at during uh, my lecture or tutorial. And uh, so in more particular, the objective for me today would be the following. So first of all, it's a practical guide to exploit 3D and 4D images. That's what I, I hope that it will be. And uh, also before going to image analysis, I'd like to mention uh, or at least show you a little bit uh, how one can do tomographic reconstruction if you are uh, uh, maybe not necessarily having access to, to the infrastructure that is ready at some places where you do the imaging. And then uh, uh, I will show you a basic quantification notebook. Now all this will be uh, the reason for developing, I guess, all, all this type of image analysis tool, toolboxes and tools is uh, two, there are two reasons. So one is that we have access or we, we can do, uh, we can acquire a, a large number of data. And uh, this data contains some, the scientific information that we are interested in. And this scientific information is often not trivial to, to dig out of this uh, uh, very large amount of data. You see here that typically if we, and I, I will relate, rel relate a lot of things to foams because this is a, a kind of my passion. I like to work with different types of foams and it's a, a nice object for 3D imaging, 3D analysis. So if one looks at the flowing system, a flowing foam and uh, acquires uh, images during uh, this uh, evolution, so time-lapse imaging, then uh, typically we end up with several hundreds of gigabytes uh, of uh, raw data projection images. Uh, I guess you heard already doing what is projection images, so I'm not repeating that. But and then uh, when you do the reconstructions, you end up with twice the amount of data if you don't throw away the reconstruct the, the projections. And uh, so from there, now the question is what to do. So one thing is to try to also uh, get the size reduced simply in in order to be able, even just able to visualize it or, or uh, just to extract uh, those informations that are critical or important for your uh, for your research which is uh, very difficult if you have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of uh, of pixel values to to get out there so that's that's uh, that's the aim and the aim is to really get this um, uh, the representations and uh, those are you know, the complexity of the representation of the data which is uh, relevant for us and be able, we are able to look at it and understand so now a uh, few steps i will show here so first time there will be a data inspection that i show you how i do that so that's the first step typically one does when uh, when you are acquiring data and that's a critical step because it's really important to do, do inspect the data during uh, at least uh, if possible very shortly after acquisition and then i <clears throat> i also would like to show you a little bit about the tomographic reconstruction and <clears throat> finally uh, in the in the after the lecture, so in the part of when, when we go to breakout rooms, I, I'll say a little bit about foam quantity, or we will then go into more a notebook uh, together and uh, do look at the foam quantification. Now, but let me start, uh, I, I guess you had something in this morning. Uh, my point here is uh, just to quickly summarize. So tomographic reconstruction, there are a number of methods, uh, really number of a uh, large number of arms. This is absolutely not uh, what you see here is really not uh, 
exhausting uh, amount, so there are many more than this, but uh, yeah, the, the most used ones, while the golden standard is the filter bed projection. Uh, and uh, if typically when you, yeah, so typically when you uh, do a, when you acquire images at the synchrotron, for example, any large scale facility or in the lab sources, uh, there is the reconstruction routines are installed and uh, you just um, change some param parameters and then you run them that's uh, that's uh, the case one what how it happens and uh, uh, here immediately i'd like to put uh, a very small uh, only one slide about uh, the tomographic reconstruction is today often coupled with what with uh, what we call uh, also phase uh, retrieval or phase uh, uh, interpretation of the of the content of the phase so the real part of the refractive index that means that we are not only looking at the attenuation contrast which is a linear uh, function of uh, of the distance the x-rays travel through the sample but also at the the uh, interference component due to the partial coherence especially now after uh, the new synchrotron sources or the upgrades of the srf also that we we uh, have to or we should exploit this uh, more and more as much as possible let's say and uh, and then this uh, phase contrast approach is uh, today most often incorporated in the reconstruction itself that you see when you come to the facilities and uh, so as i said uh, the facilities they have their own very well optimized reconstruction workflow but there are some cases where you somehow sometimes you need but sometimes you just want to to do reconstruction uh, separately or um, or you are developing uh, some toolboxes or something and then so you want to want to use it independently now, then, in, in um, one of uh, I can suggest one of the one of the possibilities there is to use uh, a very well known toolbox Astra or Tomopy, Tomopy, and that could be uh, one in, is actually included in the other. So my aim now is to give you a very quick uh, uh, flying through how actually you do this tomographic reconstruction uh, if you are using the tomopi software which is on and uh, for that i will share another screen so That was not the right one. So that's the right one. Yes. So now I'm uh, so also the tutorials, I guess, will be all or will be mostly uh, the Jupyter notebooks later on this afternoon. Uh, and so th let's start with that. Don't need to be familiar, uh, not necessarily with uh, with all this, but uh, all this what concerns the uh, Python co coding because it's uh, uh, right now. I will just fly through and uh, tell you, just show you that if you want to do a reconstruction, it's actually very simple. And uh, just uh, for example, either I can uh, directly give you the script which I have. I'm not sharing now. Right now, this is the only thing. Right now, I'm not sharing with you directly, but it's uh, but I can provide you this without any problem if you ask. Or uh, there are uh, also example notebooks on the link that you just have seen in my presentation. So now uh, here, just an introduction is to say that you see I'm using the Tomopy library, so that's uh, the only one specific library I'm using here a part of the D exchange, which is for uh, the library that is enables us to read in the data. 
So when I load in these libraries, and now I this the files the the, the data I will be working on is the is a data set that uh, you have just seen in the uh, in the in, in the intro images. So these are this is a foam data set, and uh, so when I load I load this in and it's stored in an HDF five file. And this file contains the refer the uh, images themselves, the projections, and angular result projections, and then the uh, what we call the flat and the dark images. So the images without the beam and the images without the sample. And this we do the correction here. That's the, the next next cell I clicked was the correction. So uh, the correction is uh, this one. Uh, this function. So you this is, uh, only to show you that actually all this top includes all of, uh, so the functions uh, simply uh, you can simply call it with the appropriate uh, arguments in this case is the projections the the reference images the flat images and the dark images and it does the reconstruction. Oh, so it does the normalization in this case. So this is now done, and uh, I can just plot. Um, if I if I plot along the second uh, indices, then that will be actually a sinogram. And um, having that, I will not stop here so much uh, because it's not so important. But uh, let's stop here. So I'm choosing the algorithm. And uh, there are several options. I showed you uh, these uh, slides with the options of, for example, uh, iterative algorithms, or uh, there is uh, uh, the kind of the stand one of the standard ones is called grid rec, for example. It's like the filtered back projection, very similar in performance also, and uh, but it's Fourier based. Uh, uh, so I'm choosing that one because that's uh, running the fastest on CPU uh, in this case. And then uh, finally, the reconstruction is done. Uh, if you see, it's just this one one line that uh, when then just reads which algorithm I'm choosing. There's a filter that is uh, that we can also change, and then the central rotation that I need to give it, and then the projection and the angles at which these projections were taken. So, uh, and then I can visualize. This is uh, now you see it very in a very small, but that's a one tomographic slice of the reconstructed image, and then I can save it if I wish to save it. So I do that. And then uh, here, what I actually wanted to show you is that today we have inter Stomopi integrates also this phase retrieval, and that's one line. So this is this. This is a tomo. It's a this function that where you input the correct parameters. I'm not going into details now what the parameters are, but it's simply this function. And uh, once once you did it, it's uh, what it does. It filters the projections. And then you take these filtered projections, so these ones now instead of the original ones, and you do exactly the same direct tomographic reconstruction, and then uh, just check the shape, and then uh, visualize. Now I'm zoom in a little bit, so it looks differently, and I can save in a phase map. So, so that's what I wanted to show. The rest is not uh, important. Uh, so that was a very quick. Uh, uh, jump into, into how to do tomographic reconstruction if you don't have access right now for some reason to to the uh, infrastructure of uh, one of the facilities. And uh, now let's go, let's continue in that one. So now I wonder. If you are look, if you are let's see. Okay. Now I'm not hundred percent sure which screen you see. I hope you see the right one. Yeah. 
No, that's it. Tell me if you don't see the right one. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Um, so, I would say that for uh, when we when we have the tomography reconstruction, then the, we have typically, if you look in the applications, different applications, we have two different types of uh, images, and then depending on that will be the image analysis tools also uh, that will be different. And um, of course, you can divide this uh, also in different way, but uh, I like to look at it like that, so that you have what we what I would call like large batches or so large similar images maybe time resolved data sets and or you have a uh, one scan of a unique sample and uh, and that you need to characterize somehow the features inside so there are different approaches because in while in this latter case you can often be it could be often sufficient with just having uh, the possibility to to do some visual uh, or, or a lot of uh, um, manual uh, manually guided at least uh, uh, analysis of the image while in the pre in the first case you really need to develop a toolbox uh, some tools which are uh, as much automatized as possible and just an example here is uh, when you look in com very complex systems like lungs and especially you see on the on the right here the the uh, the lungs that are inflating and deflating. So this is uh, imaging uh, the function of the lungs. In that case, the structure is not static. So you, it's actually, there is an evolution. So having this very complex structure and an evolution requires really the tools. I will not go into the demo now of visualization. I will do it. So just, I put here a demo that we will do this demo uh, on the breakout rooms. Uh, but uh, just to tell you about this uh, imaging, for example, in, uh, in uh, of the lung or the biological imaging, there needs to be quite a lot of, in order to be able to be successful in the image analysis, you need to make sure that the quality of the data that one acquires is sufficient. And uh, in, in a biological context, uh, it, it goes all down to two things, is the, result, is the time, uh, time aspect so you need to be uh, some cases uh, acquiring quickly it's time is old but you also need to take care of the dose and uh, here i show you an, an example of how one does this optimization so the exposure time if you take a constant flow of photons then depending on how what is your exposure time in this case total scan time will be determining your, the amount of photons you actually get on the sample, and that will be then determining also the dose. So you know that uh, against that works the contrast to noise ratio, where we the contrast to noise ratio, for a certain contrast to noise ratio, you need a certain amount of uh, photons that are coming on the sample because of the cross-section of the effect, for example, uh, the absorption cross-section, uh, or the scattering, it depends which signal you look at. And so if we go really uh, with a scan time, very short scan, so we start to have a contrast to noise very low. And uh, even if though the dose is reduced, it doesn't help really because this image we just cannot interpret, it's too much noise, at least with the, part, with the tools that we have. And then, therefore, we, for example, uh, we can optimize in choosing uh, the next uh, worst image, which is still, however, uh, good enough quality to get it uh, binarized, segmented. And then there is a number of uh, possible uh, parameters one can uh, get out of these binarized images uh, if one wants to describe the how these uh, regional changes, for example, in this lung tissue happen. And um, one way, which however proves not the best way, is to go do a standard, what we call a thickness map analysis. So you color the features by their size. So the darker the color here on this image, and this is a, uh, so these are different, uh, three different, uh, time steps or three different states of uh, uh, inflation of the lungs. Uh, 
uh, you see it gets more dark, more red, because the feature, the alveoli gets larger. But it's still so complex, this information, that it's really difficult to say uh, if you something meaningful biologically from the data looking into that, like, like simple like that. Instead, one often needs to come up with a solution where you find a descriptor which can transfer, so, the, so the describe your data in, a, in such a simple way that even a complex 3D data can be visualized, for example, in a 2D plot like that. That's what I, what I, I explained what it means. So uh, if you divide the space into four different types of curvature, in this case, for example, this is used in material science quite a lot, I guess. And, uh, and this, you, you say, this is type one, type two, type three, type four. And then you uh, analyze the curvatures in the 3D image. And then what, whatever you find, you put on this, uh, in this space, then you see what type of features, what type of curvatures you have and how, how much and how it changes when you change, for example, uh, the pressure in the lungs. And uh, you can also put it down at the end to the uh, superimpose into the image itself. And here, so different region, each of the four region is a color and you can then color, uh, you, can, you, you can see the color. So which type of curvature, because it is a 3D system. So it's, uh, if you just make a 2D cut, it's, you cannot say which curvature it is really because you need a 3D representation so so this one this type of things can be in are useful to be done and uh, this uh, most of this has been developed also in a swiss light source uh, by goran lovrich as, as a, in his phd thesis and can be downloaded here so and now finally the last few minutes i like to spend with the foams which will be actually the introduction to to also the uh, this uh, hands-on session that will uh, follow after in this break room, breakup room, but it, I will be quite short because then I will look into this a bit more during our uh, uh, for those who come into the uh, breakout room. So just to tell you that what one will look at will be foam rheology. So as the foam flows, for example, in this case around an obstacle and how the, um, the form uh, structure will, will change. So now in the tutorial itself, we will not go into the time resolved uh, manner. We will just actually, so each, what ha how it happens is that the, the concept is that at each time step, you actually have to characterize the form and then, then there are several different ways how you include then the time uh, component into that but I will, I can explain you it during the tutorials. So right now I will summarize a little bit with the, with this type of uh, plot, the, showing you the workflow, how typically you one I would do, I do the analysis. So when, when, when it has a acquisition of this are tomographic slice, tomog sorry, uh, projections of a system where this is, a, this is a movie. So you see, small but the foam flows this direction and you see simply uh, not the bubbles but the, what we call the plateau borders so or the water that is uh, all the, that is around the bubbles and then we do the reconstructions this i showed you for example in tomopi uh, after that one can uh, one thing to do is as i said to inspect the data first the, the, the reconstructed data and then do bit binarization eventually. So this can be done in several ways. The easiest in many of us use ImageJ, for example. So I guess most of you are familiar. If not, uh, one can also look into that. And uh, while for the next steps, I usually use uh, one of the Python libraries, which is uh, today I will show you that I use the scikit image library for a simple, simply analysis of uh, form data. And uh, 
and also for the quantification and for the time aspect also there are uh, again so I, I use the scikit but we also use another library called spam for uh, many time resolved data and I just wanted to tell you that so I, I, I'm quite sure that uh, the next uh, year, if uh, Alex will still organize these tutorials, then uh, we will uh, do uh, everything with uh, our new toolbox, which we have, uh, which we are releasing in May. I, this is our schedule now, and that will be called FormQuant, and it will include. So it will be a toolbox that will include uh, this part of the analysis, with, and specifically uh designed for analyzing cellular types of materials and uh, and this will include all the time resolved aspects so the so the 4d aspect of this analysis also so that that's uh, what we will do in a few months and it will be all on github as usual and uh, and with some examples so that's uh, that's, uh, that's the work of florian Schott, who is at the lund university now uh, PhD student and uh, we are uh, working on that. The GitHub uh, is not yet uh, publicly made available, but it will be within uh, one or two months and then in May we will release this software. And uh, I, I will st stop here because uh, the next will be then already during in my uh, break in the breakout session. And I just uh, tell you that now it's probably the time two o'clock where Alex will take over for a moment, I guess. So that's was for me everything, unless you have, and if you ask now questions or I don't know how you want to do Alex. Yeah, if there's something specific in the chat, we could quickly go through it. Um, but there is nothing I can see. So what I will do now is, thanks that we have this slide. Oh, can you open the slides again? Yes, 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 sorry for that. Because there are so nicely the breakout rooms listed. So um, just a reminder for those who missed the beginning of the session. Uh, we are now in the, let's say, more practical part. Um, we have four rooms. So those who are interested to continue with Raimond uh, on his workflows on forms, just stay. Uh, I would also recommend then people who stay at least switch on the microphone to make the whole thing a bit more interactive. Uh, um, I think none of the there, will, there is no dedicated host for every session, so there will be no chair. So basically, it will be the role of the of the lecturer also to look a bit what people want. Uh, um, but I think we are now thirty seven uh, with around maybe ten people per room. That should that should be doable. I have opened the breakout rooms so. If you look in your Zoom control, there should be now breakout rooms. Um, and we have now three additional ones to, uh, uh, together with that session. Uh, the first one is called QMDTU, that is concerning the presentation. The second one we had in the morning for the Quantitative Image uh, Center for Quantitative Image Analysis. Then uh, Reactive IP is the uh, commercial software we had as a second talk and then the University of Angers is, uh, was the last talk with, with a strong focus on deep learning. So I would suggest, assuming people listen to me, <laughs> that basically now in the next few minutes, people choose a breakout room they want to stay or want to follow. So we wait a few minutes. And for those who don't see their breakout rooms or have a, an issue, maybe raise your hand. But I see at least people are starting to migrate in the different rooms okay i was told it takes a bit of time to switch from one room to another i don't know why uh, but it's not Alex, uh, how is the end of this session? Do you can you say something about? That's individual, I would say. Um, 
if all questions are answered and no one has has also if there is silence i would say that is for me the natural end i i believe that session open i'm i'm i have i have also some experiment at the beam and i might disappear at one moment uh, uh but i think that that's that's up to you. if it's interesting and uh depending how much energy you have and time i i wouldn't put any limits yeah uh, i guess maybe this evening at seven eight when i leave i will probably close and i guess everyone who is still in is probably maybe just a ghost listener yeah mm -hmm. so people are still switching like last year we have a bit uneven uneven distribution Yeah, maybe those who are left here, could you switch on your microphone so at least we know that you are active? Okay. <laughs> there are a few. Hello. So I would say, uh, 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 Raimund, I, I, I hand you back the floor um, and you organize as you wish. I think our host is anyway, uh, uh, Alex is online in case there are questions with the breakout room. I'm sure online for a bit of a while. And I would say you start your yes, tutorial. I'm, I'm here. The only thing is uh, I don't see anyone joining the University of Andrews so far. Yeah, that I, I, I think we have to accept it, yeah. Yes. So okay. So I'm just answering one thing here. Well, it's still a little bit. Yeah, twenty-two for now. I I, I believe that maybe uh, I suggest that I encourage you. Let's say that some of you switch. Uh, uh, there and back if you want to different breakout rooms I think that's completely fine uh, with me and I also warn you that uh, I guess the other breakout room are the at least I know yeah I think most most are really the specialists in image analysis why what I will show you in this uh, room is more very conventional quantification workflow so it's really more uh, the basics and uh, not so much advanced stuff. So that uh, I want to warn you. And I really don't mind at all if you switch between uh, breakout rooms, if you go to see what the others are doing in the other room. And, uh, and I hope you can, uh, yeah, you can be a little bit interactive even though Probably we don't enjoy, especially the Zoom part of it, but uh, at least we can uh, give it that somehow. So now uh, let's see, I will uh, want to share again my screen. I just want to find what I'm going to share. So where I was now. <clears throat> Okay. Here I was, I'm going to share that one. Let's see. Again, just uh, talk to me if you don't see it in the present fair mode or so, whatever. I don't. I no, you need to swap it again. Need to swap again. Okay. Yes. I was never. So. 
Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because I shared that screen. I see. Good. Yes, thank you for the feedback. And then, uh, so there are two things I'd like to do during this tutorial. One is look into the aluminum foams. Uh, again, just a small intro. So we do a lot, or we did a lot. Actually, I was uh, participating a lot in different types of uh, time-resolved experiments on foams and uh, liquid foams was one option that uh, uh, we are also doing right now. But uh, previously I was also, right, not anymore so much, but previously I was working uh, also with, with um, various uh, teams which are experts in uh, aluminum foams, uh, such as uh, uh, Francisco Moreno uh, from, uh, Francisca Garcia Moreno from uh, Berlin, uh, Nobel Babchan from Hungary, and uh, that, was uh, quite a nice uh, time because uh, these aluminum foams, they're really pushing the limits of uh, high speed tomography. And it's a very nice uh, system for tomography because it's uh, contrast between aluminum and air is really good. Uh, so, so all is perfect actually, until you get to the moment where you need to analyze the data and then it starts to be a bit, uh, less fun because uh, it's not so trivial. So let me show uh, the data that I, I will take. So I will take in my tutorial one time step of this data, which has been uh, published uh, some time ago now, not, well, it's not uh, very long, a few years, uh, where the team of uh, uh, Francisco Garcia Moreno from Berlin, uh, Tomcat showed that uh, one can do at that time, like uh, three, three, four years ago, or a bit more, four years ago, can do tomography, uh, 200 tomography, reconstruct 200 tomographic acquisitions per second to follow the process of foaming the aluminum foams. And uh, the interest is to look at the nucleation, but also look at the uh, bubble, bubble shapes and the distribution and volume distribution and so on. And then the, uh, so these are a few videos that demonstrates you the effect. So again, I take one snapshot for this uh, that we can manage, I think, during this tutorial. And uh, that will be presented to you with a Jupyter notebook, which you will also be able to run right now without uh, installing anything. And then uh, we will also look in the visualization a little bit. So I will use for visualization, I will use two things uh, that will be ImageJ and TomViz. These are the, I guess, the simplest tools that one can have today. And then there are many more advanced tools, but that's not the point today. So uh, first of all, let's uh, do what I say that first we, we would like to inspect the data, what we have actually. So what is our input data for the analysis? And this one I will do uh, myself. Or, or no, sorry, no, maybe, maybe let's do it like this. Let's, uh, let's go directly. I just want to jump, okay. I was sorry, I wanted to jump out of my presentation. Stop my screen share and I'll start another one. So now this I will minimize for the moment and then go here. Not the right one. Sorry, I have a number of windows open, so. Okay, now you see that one. Yeah. This was the tomographic reconstruction tutorial, and now I jump to another one. And now I like to ask you one thing. If, uh, if you can, uh, 
can go in your browser and uh, do what I do. So just write uh, kaggle.com. Let's hope you see. And of course, just shout when you, you need to raise the hand or something. Just shout, and if you have some question, which something doesn't work. So you see, if you go to Kaggle, it would be great if you can make an account there. So unfortunately, this Zoom session is very difficult because I can't help you so well. I don't see what you are doing and whatever. But uh, anyway, you maybe let's try that. So and then in this. I will I will leave some time for you to do that if you don't have account there. And uh, once you will have account, you when you go and then you make a slash Raimund there, then you will land on my page. So a long time ago I did this page. So photo is not recent really, but uh, <clears throat> you can find at least. Uh, uh, what uh, what we will look into that so now I, i'm waiting a little bit because i'm uh, i just want you to have have you have all made uh, make the uh, account and if it doesn't work you should shout and tell me that it doesn't work if you don't make an account, it's also fine. In that case, what will happen is that you will simply just follow what I do. Just look what I do without being able to run it yourself. If you do an account, you can then uh, also clone the notebook and directly run it yourself whenever uh, and change it whenever you want to change something. So without having it or download it to your computer and do, run it there, it's, up, it's as you want. Now, so I'm, uh, yeah, just shout if you have uh, problems uh, with that, with something. In the meanwhile, I'm, what I will do, actually, I will just uh, probably share also the tomographic uh, notebook somehow not on this platform because there is no library no tomopi running on this right now and i don't want to and that that you can do it one one can uh, do put in the library but i am not going to do it now but um I just i will share it in a different system and uh, by the end or later on when i'm finished i will uh, send out a link on on the chat where you can uh, download both the notebook and the corresponding data set, which I just showed during the presentation. So I use that time until you put put your uh, uh, until you can log in to Kaggle. So I just posted a link. So on that link, you can see the. Uh, Tutorial, so the, the tomographic workflow, demographic uh, notebook, uh, and the corresponding data set. Plus, you, you see there also a demo for visualization. It's a different data set, but a demo for uh, doing visualization in what I sometimes used previously, not so much anymore, but uh, it's quite useful still. It's called Mavislab, which I will not show anymore in this tutorial. So now, without any feedback, I hope you have all accounts. Those who want to follow, if no, I didn't hear any issues. Uh, okay, I see one hand up, Simone, very good, Simone. So, hope others too. Let's see. But again, just shout if you have issues. This, is a, this should be as, as much as possible interactive. So if you are on, I'm not 100% sure actually how you see my homepage when you, when, you, when, you are, when you go to this address. So again, I'm not sure if you, if you directly see my notebooks, but, uh, but you will probably find out you have to, uh, because I see it differently a little bit when I'm logged in. But 
But the notebook that we will use, it's the name is Aluform Nucleation. So that will be the notebook. So if you, I hope you will find that, that notebook. And if you click on that, then this is what we will work with. And if you have an account now, then you can uh, uh, fork this, so you can clone, you can uh, clone your, uh, copy and edit, so you can clone your notebook, to clone, sorry, clone this notebook and uh, run it with me. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the point of this. Uh, and I will, um, Maybe I do it differently, so I will copy and edit it. This will be a, so this is a fork of this notebook, and you should be able to do it exactly the same as what I did now. Okay, so now let me explain. Uh, the first time it will take some time to start. So it has to download the data set. And then um, now it succeeded. So at least I check if I, I will be honest with you. I, I didn't uh, rehearse this uh, for some time now. So I hope uh, everything will work. But uh, that's a good thing about this platform that uh, usually there is absolutely no problem with that. But let's see. So. Uh, what we do in the first, I really don't know how familiar you are with the notebook. I know some of you are much better than me with that, but maybe some of you didn't see it much. So I will be sometimes a bit, uh, yeah, again, I just need, I would need some more, some feedback from you if you think it's too, 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 too straightforward, but I can't, I can't judge that so much. So uh first of all we will load the libraries so that's the first thing we will do and so you can uh, you can run uh you can run the cell or shift enter or run the cell here and uh, so what do we need here so we need this what i just mentioned the psychic image library this is what i use uh, all other things are uh, very standard I will use this pandas for uh, uh, exporting the results. So that's what uh, that's the two libraries that are uh, maybe a bit specific for this case, and then for plotting uh, the results. So that's all. So it's really not much. And this is the data set that was downloaded. And uh, now, if you run this cell, so uh what it is and now it comes the time to actually look into that a bit more um, uh what, what this data set is so uh this is the reconstruction reconstruct reconstruction stack of tiff tiff stack so it's a 3d tiff which has a uh, now the dimensions here you can see the dimensions if you run this cell so it's relatively small uh, but um, it is also in a way it's not unrealistic actually because at, did, at that speed at that time so I showed you that was 200 frames per second one can achieve that speed if one crops the image so in fact that this was the full image uh, which is often which is good for this demo it's often not the case often the image is much more so 2000 pixels or so but in this case it was not now uh, so i'm just wondering if i can uh, if i should let me let me give a second. I test check if I should open this. Uh, 
maybe what I will do, I will just open this uh, stack now, not online, not on the Kaggle. So I will stop sharing for the moment the Kaggle. And uh, what I do, as I we talked about this inspection. So I'd like to I will share the whole. Um, can you can you tell me if you see my if you see if I'm sharing with you now the there's an image J window and then you see also the notebook or you see yes. yeah, we can see them both. Okay, good. good, good, very nice. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll open um, data set. So the TIFF, just to show you. So image J, so I hope maybe most of you are familiar with image J, not then you should download, it's a good thing. So, and I have, the data here and uh, this is the data set that you also have so now what this number means is is actually is the is number 861 um it's the tomography number 861 in the series so i think here we acquired uh, i can't remember exactly but uh, a bit more than 1500 tomograms in this series so this is uh, in the second half of the of the acquisition cycle of uh, of the acquisition train let's say uh, and this is a already a reconstructed tomographic data set uh, no that was not the correct one sorry no six I made probably a mistake here, so I need to see. Otherwise, I, you know, uh, what one can do. I can just download it. This is you can do also. So at least it's good. You see, you just download the data set because somehow it, I had the wrong one on my computer. So, and then. Um, Okay. okay. So oh, this is the one. This is the one. Now, okay. So that's that's the stack. So here the bubbles are already large. So, but also there are still a plenty of small ones. So this is in the middle of the process of nucleation and creating the aluminium foam, right? And uh, so it, this is just that you see what we are working with. You see the images are not uh, extremely clean but that acquisition speed is a this is the price for that now coming back to the notebook so close this uh, so i i do this 
one other way to do to inspect a little bit the data set is uh, is, is quite a handy thing is to to make a, a, this kind of projections in in the three different directions so you so you have a 3d volume and then you make a projection just to, just to see project the intensity to see looks uh, looks good still we are still in this inspection phase and then uh, the first thing you want to do with the data set is binarization you can do it in image j that's uh, that's extremely straightforward you you can adjust the threshold in a very simple way and then now uh, here and then uh, so you can threshold out uh, certain features like this so and then sometimes it gets a bit more involved when for example you want to make sure that you are optimizing your threshold also to see the small holes the small pores and things like that so it depends on the data set in this case there are challenges with these small pores, but uh, it could work also in this very simple way. I think the, the if you are more interested in the how this binarization could be done in very challenging samples, then I think the the tutorial of the machine learning will be is what is running now is also dealing with that. Now, uh, here I will be very simple, and I first of all. Uh, what we do, we will just uh, remove if there are pixels which have uh, too high and too low values, uh, so below uh, statistically, uh, well, this could be bad pixels and things like that. So this is just first processing step. And after that, we can do a, a sim simple uh, thresholding. And so how we do this? Uh, for first of all, here I, I we can do the thresholding on the original image also. But uh, what I wanted to also show you is that you can improve your chances to do the good threshold if you employ some. Um, in this case, we are quite. Uh, noisy because it's a very high acquisition speed so depending on how the how the data set looks like you can decide to do some preprocessing before the binarization typically one uses a filter and in this case i'm also using a kind of a filter which is uh, 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 also uh, part of the uh, scikit library and that's the the denoising algorithm so you see a result here so you see the difference between these two and the difference you see much nicer if you plot the two histograms so this one is the histogram of the yeah so this one is the original the histogram of the original values while this one is the histogram of the uh, the processed one or that one so there are it's a bit different the features you see that here and this is interesting so uh, in the dark end side so the darker uh, so the darkest is the air uh, th this one while there is a lot which is a kind of gray but it's not aluminium it's it's uh, somehow these small pores which are at the limit of our resolution they are uh, uh, not uh, completely dark as air but they are because of the point spread function and the noise they are in fact uh, more light than air even though there are pores so this uh, helps us a little bit to, to be able to deal with those. We will not spend now too much time in this binarization, but uh, uh, when, when this is done, 
uh, I'm still using here just a very simple threshold uh, based binarization based on the histogram. So I just set the threshold because I, I looked at the histogram. And uh, so that's, uh, that's all. I'm not going into any, uh, any fancy bi binarization uh, methods here. For example, if you, if you download this, um, this demo from the share link, which is this, in this Mavis lab, so, for example, there I, it's also, if you, if you open, I hope you can, maybe if you have Navis Lab, then there is a, there's another, uh, I, I make a demo on another way of binarization of 3D, and that's the, that's based on the random walker, uh, where you uh, put seeds, a few of the, few seeds on the, in the face, which is interconnected in the image. And then based on that, uh, uh, there is a decision where, uh, which one will belong to which phase. And that, so that's, uh, that's one way. Here I still show you a bit more. So this was the simple thresholding. Uh, there is slightly more complete let's, or complex uh, way. It's not much more is uh, where I tell that I know definitely that everything which is above 0 0.55 now, so everything is normalized, it's 0 to 1. Below 0, uh, above 0 0.55, then I will associate it with the uh, phase 1. And uh, below 0 0.45, phase 2. And, <clears throat> and it will, I will plot now the, the map. So there will be, so I know definitely that uh, I know for sure that what is the air is white, and I know for sure the gray, aluminum, but I don't know those things which are left uh, black, I don't know. And uh, for that I can use now, and on those pixels actually, which, are, we don't, we don't know, which I don't know what are they, I can use also this uh, random walker segmentation it will take some time. I'm not completely remember. Or it, sometimes it's this the thing and this kaggle. Sometimes it's short. Sometimes it's uh, not so not running the same speed as other times. So we will see uh, how fast it goes. And then actually, I, yeah, I didn't have to save so much. But okay, well now it was relatively fast. So yes. So that's uh, so I just show here. Now the the final segmentation with some with the contours around so that we have some some view of that. And uh, okay. And now what I do, I'm simply inverting it because if I remember well, we will use this. Um, uh, this will be the the input image to our analysis, further analysis. So. We, let's say now we are happy with the binary binarization, even though I, I'm not, uh, of course, we, I'm not saying that there is uh, no better way to do it, uh, but this, let's say we are happy. And now another purposing step, which is not necessary to go into much detail is, I, we call it created the bubble image. That means that uh, in fact, we are just, uh, taking that part of the sample that is the, the aluminum form, the sample itself. Well, you know, when you do the tomographic reconstruction, then you, you have uh, also, so these are pixels which would be interpreted as air. So we, we are just uh, making sure that it's, that the algorithms will know that what we, what we are working with is, is within this envelope, which is, uh, it's like a mask kind of, it could be a mask. So that's what uh, is done now. Okay, I, I guess we have that one. And then now we have this uh, binarized image. And the uh, first thing we can do is typically we, we start with looking into the uh, distance map because what, why is the distance map interesting? So it's again the SciPy library. And uh, I just start this, run this one. Uh, 
I'd like to show you why is it interesting in coming back. I have a slide on that. So when one has a foam and uh, if, you, if you don't see a slideshow that I'm showing that just shout, but if you have a foam uh, and this is a cross section, so a tomographic slice to the foam, you don't see the bubbles, but this is what is interesting for you, the bubbles, you want to reconstruct those. But uh, because you don't see the films, typically this is like open foam, so you don't, have, don't see the films. Even if you would see the films, it's uh, um, uh, and you see only some, so it's, uh, it's not enough to to clearly uh, define which is a bubble, one bubble, and which is the next bubble. So you need to develop some algorithms for that. And one of the algorithms is that we separate uh, artificially the two bubbles and we create these films kind of. So one way is to do this is to check, you take each white pixel and you check the distance of these white pixels to the dark pixel, so to the liquid in this case, or this would be the aluminum and this would be the air. And then you plot the distance or you, yeah, you, you plot the distance or you, in another way, uh, you you, uh, you visualize the distance like that, the distance map, <clears throat> and uh, when you do this, then the distance map. This is actually shows you the distance map in a schematic way. So this is the the distance of this point to the nearest. Sorry, of each. This is this is a distance of each point in this uh, bubble or in this white uh, range to the nearest uh, dark bubble. And that's the distance map. So that maps the distance of that. And then wherever you, if you, you can see here the 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 where the distance map value is the highest. That's the point which is farthest from every side from the liquid, and that's the center of the bubble. If the bubble is a round bubble, so that's. Uh, that's how we use the distance map. And uh, you see now the result here coming up. This is the distance map. So it's exactly what I told you. So if you have a large, now I see here, this is a different different slide. So slice, sorry. Here I took, for example, slice number 10. I can, if I take number 60 here, that will be this corresponding to that one now you see so because the, here i took number 60 it was not the same so now it corresponds and uh you know if you have the largest bubble has a, also the brightest color because it's the largest distance from the aluminium from the black face here now on those ones on this distance map i calculate the local maxima so the local maxima, why? Uh, you just saw it probably on the, what I showed before. The local maxima will be, in this case specifically, it will be very clear, it will be the middle of the bubbles. And uh, once we have the, so this would be, now I'm plotting here the, uh, the these points here, if you see, or if you see on your own screen, then the points are, in fact, the, now I projected all, all the seeds, so all the centers of the bubble. So this, we, we have found, in this case, 2,800 uh, potential uh, maxima. So those are potential seeds for the bubbles. And, uh, and from these ones, we will using uh, also a very well-known uh, method in, uh, in image analysis, using the watershed, we will try to, uh, from based on these seeds, we try to uh, find, associate the 
voxels uh, around these seeds to to each individual bubble. Now I for come back a little bit to my presentation in this case. So what it will do, it will it's called watershed because it's uh, if you now would reverse this. So that means that this will, so you just, in, sorry, not reverse, inverse. So upside down, if you would plot it upside down now, I could even do it. In fact, very, not a very nice way, but yeah. So you see now in this case is, in this case, you start from a seed and you, you, Kind of simulate that there is a water level growing, growing until it touches with the other. So if you would fill this with water and this with water, and then it will at some point that one will flow to the other, and but that you don't want, so you stop it just before. So that's the way how watershed is actually recognizing the bubbles. So that's what uh, what is now done here and uh, it's done so now i think it looks like there was a small mistake with this uh, i'm still it somehow still takes into account but okay we don't worry about that too much now but you see it still takes into account this outer regions not so sure why but okay so which is not uh, right because one would need, one will need to simply eliminate it now because otherwise it will come to the that is to the analysis uh, if you want to uh, get the uh, the quantitative uh, values now so we did a simple watershed uh, and uh, it's definitely not perfect. Uh, it looks uh, okay, but in, in the slide that oops, oops, oops. even on, on that slide, actually, especially maybe let me see 65. Yes, so you, you see that if you look at this dark blue bubble, uh, it has two labels, and that's typically one of the issues. So you see here is coming in. So there is a there is a number of uh, number of things one yeah, one needs to be be careful and it's not uh, necessarily working always. So you know that was typically probably a seed that was uh, that should not been should not have been there. Uh, so one has to always look look and uh, after one does the watershed to to make sure that there is a, all is done properly and then typically or sometimes when maybe you need to uh, change the threshold maybe there was uh, some voxels or one voxel that was uh, left there identified as a uh, the wrong phase so so this uh, this this happens but uh, If we are, if we accept, accept the, uh, we always have to accept certain amount of error, especially in these very noisy images. So let's say in this case, we accept this for the tutorial sake. And then uh, once we have that, so, okay. There are a lot of, uh, there's another, there is not a lot, but there's a number of things that uh, you can see are also not correct. So these ones, they got the same label, uh, most probably, but it looks like uh, these are not the same feature. So, so there are a certain, uh, there is always a certain amount of, um, of errors. So <clears throat> if we, however, if we say that the best is, and this is what actually this new toolbox will do, uh, which I mentioned to you, is that the, it will evaluate also the uh, the uncertainty. 
of with which you are doing you are at each step so and that's partly based on that we always use uh, two methods which are at least somehow independent to each other to do most of the critical steps and uh, and then that helps us also to be able to assess the uncertainty in the analysis which i think is a very important step in uh, when when one looks into the image analysis of large data or compli complicated data sets where you by eye you don't notice necessarily every error and even if you notice you may be not uh, so able to correct so well i need to now run to, to the next cell, which will be the properties. So once you have what we call the labeled image, so this is the labeled image. Uh, on, for example, the scikit image library itself already includes quite a number of uh, possibilities to measure certain properties, and it's called uh, this is the function called region props. And um, this function, if you, if you call this, I will run, launch this box now. Uh, it will, it already, once, once the segmentation, so the labeling is done, it already has everything. Uh, so it's not calculating anything. Now you, we are just calling the, uh, the, the values that, that are, so far implemented in psychic image in 3d and this is also this is all 3d so this for example and it's not so many in 3d but uh, a field area and then the centroid position so these are the these are these numbers these three numbers that appeared here and this if i take um, for example bubble number 50 then uh, there is uh, that one so it's really these are really the bubbles so which bubble i take so these are the coordinates these two last are the coordinates of this bubble number 100 <clears throat> yeah. so <clears throat> to get some thing in my throat after this monologue. Well, several things we can do now is, um, I will actually not run this because it's really long. Uh, it's maybe, we will see, but uh, you can run it. It's uh, This is not so important. I'm not using it actually, but you can also mash the surface and uh, that could be useful for a number of uh, reasons uh, but it also sometimes there are many there are, so there are a lot number of uh, tools for meshing also in the tutorial kim tutorial today that is running now parallel i guess maybe they are also showing you uh, one tool for a bet better tool for meshing but uh, actually, I can, I can run it. I'm, I know it ran very quickly. I'm surprised that it did. It's okay. Okay. Anyway, now one can save also the image. So, a labeled image. So, this one, you can save it. And if you have saved it, I can open it. Okay, let's see if I downloaded it uh, because I didn't download it right now, but uh, I should have downloaded it earlier. So, Mm 
Yeah. The results here labeled should be that one. Yeah. So you see, these are the labeled. I mean, this is not uh, showing in the image J so well, but because it's a different color map, but I will show you in a different way this one. So I, I told you, I will show you just one, uh, one simple option, how to look into 3D images, which I, I like to use because it's, it is really the simplest probably. Uh, that you can do for uh, visualizing 3D images. And that's TomViz, it's called TomViz. I use it uh, often for, uh, it's mostly, I use it mostly for visualization. That's what it does. So it's not so much more. I open the data and I can open here that one. No, it's not the right place. So that, and uh, here you can, uh, one can look at the volume representation. I can remove the size and uh, so, we can take uh, any direction of the slice. And remove the volume. So if you click on this eye, should remove, yeah. And then you can just uh, play with the slice. Okay, uh, back to the volume. So one can also use this to clip. This is not the right plane. You can choose a plane X. Uh, you can clip if you like to play with it like that. You can also choose a different color map. So this software was developed for electron tomography. So actually, if you are interested, it has all the alignment of electron tomography. But I, I don't really use much a part of very simple way to visualize it. Visualize, it's a simplified version of Paraview, maybe some of you know. So, so that's, uh, that was the result of our labeling. <clears throat> but now this was an image. But now what we want, and this is, I recommend you to do in the script uh, when, if you have forked it, is to save the results actually, not the images only, but the results. And the results are the following, for example. So you you take from this uh, from the properties, from this uh, region properties function. And uh, uh, so you take, for example, the, the, the bubble volume, that would be, that would be the, uh, that will be this property. So it's a field area because it's coming from the 2D interpretation, the 2D implementation of, of uh, previously it was, scikit image was only working in 2D and some of the functions were transferred in 3D, not all, many, many are not, but this one, and it's a field area, but it's actually the volume if you have a 3D image. So, 
So, and then you can save it as a CSV file and you can open, I often open it uh, just uh, with the Python or you can open it in uh, Excel as you, as you like. So this, uh, this is, this is what you always want to get on to, to, to get this type of uh, data representation with, with numbers, which are uh, uh, easy to handle in text file, uh, not big, and uh, that's uh, nice. And now there is a last part, and this part I can launch, or you can launch, but this one really runs a long time, typically. So I don't know. Today it seems that it's running really fast compared to usually. So maybe it will uh, run really fast. It seems really fast actually compared to usually, but it will still take time. So, so this is a thickness map. I showed you the thickness map when we were looking into the lungs and I showed you it's uh, quite uh, complex. Uh, and, you know, so I, I just brow, uh, go now to the end of this script. So this is the script that you actually fork from. And uh, so when you do this, so this is the thickness map, uh, which has been, I did previously. And uh, what it does is it, now it takes the bubbles and now it colors the bubbles based on their size. So, so again, the darker or the, yeah. So the, you have the, here between blue and the red. So the, the more red or uh, darker red, the color uh, is uh, more, um, is larger. So it's a larger diameter. So that's it. So it's in fact, what it does, is is actually only rearranges you see it's actually just rearranges the indices of the bubbles it looks at their volume and it tells okay you are bubble number one because you are the biggest guy and then so on and so that's uh, that's what it does and then it uh, you can plot it and with, with, with some color map that you choose so, yeah, so you see it's 3%. So this will not be finished. No, we, we are finished before that, well before that. And um, yeah, I guess uh, now I would like to see if you are interested in something. To, to ask. Um, because this was more or less what I prepared. Or I didn't really prepare, but what I used to give al always is uh, in the user meeting. Uh, and I guess, as I told you, this will probably be the last one. Uh, because next year on, we will uh, do this directly on the on the new toolbox so that will be a bit different next year it it will be really a bit more involved because this toolbox is a bit more complex than what i showed you now and especially because it goes into the time resolve aspect so it now maybe this i can still tell you is that when you now we analyze did some analysis on one volume so this is a time step number number six hundred or so. Six, actually, it's I, I was wrong. It's six thousand. Uh, so we we did uh, some ten some ten thousand uh, uh, tomographies in one in this series. This this is only a few seconds. So ten thousand tomograph scans in a few seconds. And uh, so what I what I showed here is a pick one time frame now. You, you create, typically how we work is we, you create this uh, notebook uh, and you tune it until you are happy with the result. That means that you, you know, you get a precise binarization 
more precise than what I showed you here uh, in this one, simple one. Uh, precise binarization without any, or with a really minimum, let's say, you can accept one, two percent errors. But in the in forms, not much more because uh, the processes in forms are uh, uh, quite complex. So that if you miss misinterpret that there's two bubbles instead of one, then you can misinterpret the the system in the sense that uh, you think that it had to, there was a coalescence even happened in that place, which was not it's just your analysis. So, so one has to be careful there. So. But once you have that, uh, you, you will run this on as a batch script on the 10,000 volumes. And uh, if you are happy, uh, if you are lucky, lucky, and then you don't, for example, the image contrast didn't change during acquisition, or, or uh, at least most of the parameters stayed same. The form has changed, so the trouble is that this, uh, especially in the aluminium form, so we will it will be difficult to to use the same tools uh, in the nucleation phase and in the phase where the form is already uh, almost created or created. There are these will be different a little bit the tools, but let's say uh, typically. As I say nowadays, and this is uh, what we develop, we work with the more uh, liquid forms. Uh, and these forms are, uh, you don't have nucleation. What we're looking for is actually events that lead to energy minimization in this system. So, for example, uh, the, uh, that, that, uh, that the cells, the bubbles, they change their neighbors because they like more the other that means that the whole system is energetically more stable so this type of events and for this type of events uh, you can really do very well in a batch manner so you just run the same thing exactly the same script for everything now if you have this that uh, I, I showed you here for example I one of the things you can save um, I don't know. Uh, actually, we that I, I didn't save it here, but you can save the the centroid position. So that's the position of the bubble. Then it's this you can save the same way as you saving here the diameters. And this centroid positions there will they will tell you about the uh, the the position of each bubble in that uh, moment of time. And when you choose another time step, so the next time step, and you made your acquisition cleverly so that, bet that between two time steps, you don't have a, a big a jump that is larger than a certain number, certain value, for example, that the bubbles doesn't move more than half of the diameter or something that you have uh, some criteria, then you can, uh, you can follow in time so one way how we then implemented there are at least there are several ways but one way is to simply track the centroids of the bubbles for that you need to make sure that you recognize the same bubble in two time two steps consecutive time steps so there one has to develop some uh, some small tools another way is that i mentioned in the presentation that there is a toolbox another toolbox uh, it's called spam some of you may probably use it or maybe use it. That toolbox is developed in Grenoble and also in Lund here. Uh, and this toolbox is really useful for, uh, it was originally based on uh, on uh, digital volume correlation. Uh, now it does a lot more things and much more, many more things. And it can do, uh, it can actually track labels in time between two uh, in a time series so yeah so that's that that would be that that's the next step after uh, after i showed you here uh, but uh, these are a bit more involved working with the 
with all these times, all, all the all the representations of all time steps. So, so I'm, we are not. Uh, I'm not going to show you that one. Uh, not on the Kaggle at least. So yeah, that was it from my part. I'm. Uh, I'm stopping sharing and I'm just uh, looking if you have any question or uh, doesn't have to be a question it could be a comment that there was something that is old-fashioned which is most of it what I showed you is kind of old-fashioned it's really the aim was here to give you some basics if you have not done so much in image analysis for the others of you, I think it was uh, too basic, but um, 